awesome. So, and you will fit right in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, yeah, we got some sponsors here, but we really appreciate you coming on. It's gonna be awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. great, great discussion. I got uh, Alan sent me a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so stuff I guess it's coming out shortly or is out already. Uh, in addition, with a whole bunch of other other things going on that you have going on with yeah, yeah I, it's a, it's already out. I think Anna got it. Oh, good. I bought some. Oh, great. Yeah, it was like two weeks ago or a week ago or something. So, yep. Fantastic. Good. Well, yep. I, I sent a newsletter to uh, free of charge, downloadable. It was five thousand words. Or kind of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's quite a but, newsletter. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm isolated here in France. I don't come that in the convention circuit and stuff, so people think I'm a ghost. In this yeah. <laughs> I'm just showing once again that I'm not dead yet, according to Monty Python. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> That's wonderful. Get so. What I gotta do, free stream here. Put out uh -huh. the Put out that we are discords we are live all the technical jargon i'm just doing as we're chatting up here so do what you have to do do what i gotta do yeah which i yeah yeah so I, i'm just passing through <laughs> <laughs> yes but it's gonna be a great pass through here so get those old portrait works so many cool. great technological and cool yeah, things. Yeah, I just found some some cool stuff in here that I missed the first time I read it. Really? And, and yeah, th there's some cool stuff that I think will be dynamite for interesting that people could not realize that I think is really, really cool. Big well, D&D yeah, stuff. I always try to create new stuff because that's something the idea of fantasy and the unknown. Once you know thing, it's so yep. long uh, fantastic, is it? So mm -hmm. we and, uh, that's great. And that's quite a chore to do. You keep on creating new stuff. I yeah. agree, one hundred percent. I mean, my campaigns in year forty-three from Greyhawk. I mean, ever since I was twelve years old with the original folio, uh, and uh, it, it's a challenge. Uh, and that's we have a lot of custom classes because of that. You know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, Greyhawk was the ultimate sandbox world, lightly detailed. Mm -hmm. Crazy! It's like handing a kid a, a set yep. of Lego. Oh, so, I, dead on, dead crazy. on. Yeah. Until yeah. us fans are, are, are screwing it up by by creating all these super detailed things. That <laughs> 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 well, there's a difference between game and and immersion. Maybe I'd like to talk about that. Oh, please, yeah. I mean, we can go whatever direction you want to go. Absolutely. Yep. I, I guarantee you, the audience is going to have. Some oh yeah, they will love too. this. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So as people are rolling in here, um, I'm just getting out my uh, personal. I send a lot of people direct Discord messages. We're live because you know, just right. like just like my just like my players, they don't remember what they had uh, for lunch that day when they show up at my game at night. So they kind of everyone's got that brain mush. So uh, <laughs> it's too much going on in life. So send out a lot of reminders yeah but, but when you enter the fantasy world you gotta take people out of the game and out of life that's true and it's a nice mm -hmm. escape it's yep it's nice to have so showing a lot of my 3d print companies here i get that one up and then we're gonna go so i keep on looking up to see if alan because alan just posted something in discord and, and uh um, anna he just posted something in the in the, in the legends oh. Discord. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm like, well, all right. Let's make sure I got them all out. I think I did. I got them all out here. Oh, yeah. Uh, I even sent Malden something. Yeah. A lot of gray, a lot of gray fans still. Oh, oh my, yes, the community is huge. We just like many, last, many, yeah. Awesome. Many uh, tens of thousands. Yeah, we uh, we have like, we had uh, from Thursday night to last Sunday, we had that fundraiser where we, uh, it's the fifth annual, and we did for 
St. Jude, and it was all Greyhawk content over like 12 different Twitch channels I coordinated, and um, we raised $25,400 this year, so. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's supposed to be, last year we did 20,000, so we surpassed it. I was, we were all really happy about the, uh, the community stepping up. It was awesome. Hey, sure. Rex Fellas, Mike Disney, good to see you. Big, 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 big discussion tonight, everyone, is we're going to be on shortly. Oh, tonight, this morning. Tonight. <laughs> yes. Well, tonight for the Rubs. Yeah, yeah exactly. Robert, it's taking you so even though right now. It's approaching night. <laughs> Too early to start lobbing questions. Yes, uh, Dale, give me a suggest. Otherwise, we work magics. Uh, yeah. yeah. You'd be talking to me via Ouija board. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. Len told us that story that Ouija was supposed to be Ouija. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that was a great story. He came up with some good ones. Who's that? Len Lakofka. Len Lakofka. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they, they wouldn't let him call, call her Ouija, like the board, so he had shit. They went to Ouija. He's always said, pronounce it BG, and everyone's like, really? <laughs> oh, that, 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 okay. Maybe it's the, uh, it, it, it's, uh, multiples, you know. It's BG is for num numerous Ouija board. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're like gonna come live here shortly, a couple minutes early. <laughs> A pretty or a freak. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, hey, Les, good to see you. I'm talking to the people on Twitch already, so we got a crowd yep. already building up. Mm -hmm. Where's Alan? I don't know. I, I I, that's what's coming. weird. Um, um, I sent, I sent him a Facebook Messenger message. Yep, he's supposed to be here. So he's yep. supposed to be here. Um, Alan, yeah. Uh, so uh, I will send him another message right now. He posted on, on in Discord 10 minutes ago. Yeah, so I know. So know he, may, he may be one of those where he's going to come on promptly at 10. Yeah, he thinks they will come on on the minute. Not yeah, the and, early, and, so, yeah, yeah, Alan, uh, he'll be here. Alan's never not, ever he's not a, shown up when. Uh, exactly. Yeah, he, yeah, he's so, the one. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just he's trying promised. to send him. You want to send him a message, Anna? Just say, uh, sure. just say yeah. Rob said, oh, there he comes. Here he comes. Okay, perfect. Look at that. Yep. Boom, boom. There he is. There he is. Good morning. Oh, he hasn't connected yet. So, yep. Good morning. There we go. He is. And we're coming Good live morning. here. Look at that timing. Five minutes yep. early. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alan. Hello, Rob. How are you? How am I what? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Rare on form. Rare form. <laughs> Good morning on a Saturday morning here. Um, special Gavin, really excited. Um, welcome everyone, legend uh, in D&D &D and with Greyhawk, Rob Koontz. Rob, good morning. Welcome and good afternoon to you from Corsica. Yeah, vice versa. It's great, great to have you on, and I want to say thank you so very much to Alan, who really facilitated this. Oh, sure. Happy to help. And Alan sent me a whole bunch of stuff, too, and we're going to have some stuff scrolling through. And t Rob, this discussion can go however you want. You know, you want to talk about the early days, accomplishments, what you got going on. I, I know we're going, to get a, we're going to get bombarded with questions from the audience. Um, Alan pr okay. provided me with a lot of things. Uh, can you can you go back like though to the beginning? Like, how did everything come together? I think the audience would love to hear that. The, like, you know, talking well, about the it was My mother and father, and uh, I was an offspring. How far back do you want me to go? Like, no. As far back as you want to go, relevant to the Gary Gygax meetup, or you know. <laughs> 
how things oh, started. Uh, meeting Gary Gygax. Oh, that's uh, well, that's a uh, rather roundabout subject. Okay. I was uh, my mother had had a nervous breakdown. I was in care of the upstairs neighbors and my aunt, who was visiting on the weekends, who was seven miles away in Delavan, Wisconsin. And my birthday was coming up. I wanted a gift. Um, I had been looking through the upstairs neighbors who had taken care of me, their uh, Playboy magazine. <laughs> And I had gotten to the gift section for Christmas because, you know, all these magazines come out early. So, and it was a dog fight game. And I said, let, uh, I convinced her to go looking for it downtown Lake Geneva at the uh, Benjamin, uh, at Schultz Brothers, Five and Dime. And they didn't have it there. Uh, but they, uh, Larry Zirk, who's not mentioned too often, was the assistant manager. And he says, we don't have that, but we have this, these Avalon Hill games. One of it, uh, the only one he had was Utland, which was the gotcha. of World War I Navy yeah. battle in the British and, the, and the German high sea police. And, uh, and he says, and we meet up every uh, weekend to play these games at this Gary Gygax's house, which was a straight line out three blocks outside of mine. He lived in Wisconsin the Center. I lived in Wisconsin and Madison Street. And, uh, and, he, and he, if you want to, he says, you can come on over. He teach you how to play these games. Now, this is all my Aunt Minnie. She could have said no, and I wouldn't be sitting here. Wow. Uh, uh, and during the time period where I'm by myself as a kid, my mother's, we don't, our father's dead a long time when I was two. And she decided, oh, okay, you can go visit. That started it all. And then I met up with Gary. I, he also sent us up to the other game store that carried it, the Jack in the Box near the Dairy Queen on Wall Street, which is <laughs> a mile. And uh, and I picked up the AfterCore game, and Larry Zerk called me. I we exchanged numbers, and he asked me what I had done, and I said I picked up the AfterCore game. I was looking at it, and I was enthralled by it, and I didn't know what the hell it was, but I was going to learn it. And, and he says, well, we've arranged for you to come on over and play in their, uh, play a game at Gary. So I went over there like a week later. I walk in and uh, <clears throat> Bill Hoyer who was the IFW president, International Federation of Wargaming, Wargamers president. And Gary were setting up a game of Africa for. Of course, Larry, had, who lived right down the street from Gary, told him that I would there. Uh, I had purchased that, so I I looked at it in amazement and said, "Oh, I have Africa Corpse too," and I called it Corpse. So uh, instead of Core, and Gary uh, Gary looked at me and kind of chuckled. He says, "Well, it isn't a corpse yet?" And then they, they explained between <laughs> the two words, and that's how I met the guy Gax. On Gary and became involved in gaming. That was in 1972. And then somewhere, and I know you're celebrating oh, the 50th yeah, this yeah, year. Excuse me, let me correct. That was in 1968. 68. Wow, man. Phew. And then somewhere in the 70s, somewhere. Oh, chain mail comes out, right? And then, and then from that, uh, you guys uh, all decide. Well, it, it didn't occur from a membrane in outer space. Uh, we play tested this thing. Okay. And based upon uh, Perrin, Jeff Perrin being influenced by the Bodenstedt rules or last limb figures, and, which had been published, serialized in the uh, strategic, uh, um, excuse me, strategy and tactics by Chris Wagner. 
and they had serialized Bodenstead. Now, Bodenstead was out in the East Coast, and he had all these last ones, and he was connected in the hobby shop thing, and he was he just didn't want them for display, and he wanted to actually make a set of rules for him to play these battles. And this is why when Paul runs, the, uh, occasionally runs the, uh, Paul Sturmer runs the uh, Legends of Wargaming, they'll do a reenactment of the Bodenstead, the siege of Bodenstead. So, uh, and then Perrin decides to make four pages rules for this, which he then brings down to Gary. And so this is what I've gotten from Bodenstead to use with mine, because uh, with my miniatures, because he's working in the uh, hobby shop in Rockford as the manager or the owner. I can't distinguish which at this point. And and he's purchasing these things too, and he wants to game them. And this is how, and then Gary gets involved and we start play testing these on the sand table that we had previously used in Gary's basement for um, the tactics play test and which came first. So, uh, it, you know, everything just continued. And then the fantasy supplement was the last minute thing. And we started looking around the dime stores and Lake Geneva for weird figures. And Gary was doing conversions and stuff. So that's where that comes in. He, he had always promoted wanting to have fantasy in games very early. Uh, he had uh, in the Courier, he was pushing it and so forth. The magazine, the Courier overseas, and he was pushing fantasy. He wanted fantasy. Uh, he thought that fantasy and science fiction were prime for bringing into miniatures and board games. Yeah, I mean, and then from there. All is uh, I mean, history. Arneson, uh, gets a hold of the idea through the uh, Bronstein stuff to take this whole initiative to another level and starts mm -hmm. creating uh, dungeons where uh, where he first uses the chainmail combat system and then he discards it because these people are dying on one hit and he puts in hit points. He starts mm -hmm. giving a lot of hit points because they're losing their characters. They're talking about playing in this realm as dukes or barons or whoever they're playing at. And now their characters in one combat are dead, so their history's gone. So he just, uh, they, they, so they jettisoned the chainmail uh, combat system and went to this hit point, aggregate hit points that he handed out. You had more if you're a fighter, I believe. And, and that, what well, that comes from the first fantasy campaign in the 19th, uh, in, 1972, the last issue that was published of the uh, Dome Staple, uh, we, uh, I published Secrets of, of, of Blackmore. Now, we, I, I was also exchanging letters with Dave at the time about what he was doing. He was sending me these odd letters, one of which survives from his side. Uh, that uh, he's saying, you know, uh, you know, we had a Balrog the other night, wipe out the whole party and do this and that. And he's, spe he's speaking in a lingo that we have not been using in chain now. All right. So, uh, so much later, 1972, he demos the game for us very late in 72. Demos the game along with Dave McGarry. And this is where it all starts of what they've been doing for a year and a half up in Minneapolis. And uh, and then it just continues. Gary's caught on to it. We, him and I sit down the next day and go through a storytelling episode, which the map survived from that, which I drew. So ostensibly, I'm the first DM. I'm the first DM of Lake Geneva. That's because awesome. I'm, I'm DMing Gary through the first thing that he thinks is going to be used as a story game. Uh, he wasn't too hot on the idea after two play sessions, but those two maps survived from it. Um, and and then he started the correspondence with and telephone calls very heavily with Dave to send his notes down. They typed them up and sent them down. Gary said they had to be uh, recodified and remade. But the, the, the idea that Arneson 
demoed an idea to us that is preposterous. Uh, game systems only work if you have a system. Whether it was written up or not, or on notes, and in his mind, it was a functioning system. And this is what started everything. So if you look at Artisan, it's already gone into this conceptual realm games, and then decides that he's going to continue iterating it and because it's it's endless. You can continue iterating. We we faced the same thing with D D when we were creating it. Finally, Gary says, Well, this is enough. This is a nice base for everyone to then to go from. It's the same thing Artisan was. He was still iterating Blackmore when and adding rules to it as we went along. And this is exactly what happened with D. We continue adding more, we continue to iterate. So it's it's kind of a it, it, what D and D is. It's an open form sort of uh, game guideline that allows you to interface at multiple levels depending upon what you want to do with it. Yeah, and that's what it is. Why? Because it's driven by the imagination. It's driven by personal wants. It's driven by personal knowledge. It's driven by what you think is interest. That of course, it leads to the ultimate variability with everything. And this is why Gary said it wasn't going to cost you much to play the game because it was, you know, what's the price of imagination? Yeah, true. Uh, and we know that's true because uh, we had Ed Greenwood on a fancy mapping show, and he was showing us maps he was doing in 68 and 72. And he goes, I was just making maps. There was no game yet. I didn't know what I, you know, and, but, and, and then this, I, I found this game. Mm -hmm. And then it all fit. My imagination fit into it. Yeah, well, it's the same thing. A lot of people who create paracosms like uh, the Brontes, uh, Emery R. Barker, you can go on with the list. Uh, but Emery R. Barker had his whole world described, and then all of a sudden Mike Menard runs into him up in Minnesota, and this whole thing takes a turn to wanting to create the first fantasy world, which TSR published really was uh, Empire of the Pedal from Takima. So, uh, it, it, yeah, it, you, you start creating these things. The, the whole thing with Greyhawk, it wasn't, was not designed whole, whole cloth. It came from different facets. It came from the Castle and Crusade Society, Great Kingdom Map. It came from Gary's uh, chainmail battles it came from is uh comic chick right well the first novel he did with, with uh how come i can't remember the name of it gnome cash gnome cash yeah it comes from <laughs> that. nice and and but it, it, strangely um dragon never finished the serialization of that they started publishing and never finished so, uh, but I can tell you the ending. Please, let's hear it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> because I contributed to it. Uh, it, it. During the day where I was Gary's apprentice, and I was sitting there in his, in his study, I'd sit on the bed very calmly as he wrote things, whether it was a letter or stuff. But if he was writing a novel, which he wrote a couple when I was there, doing that, I'd sit and watch him write, right? And he'd hand me the pages as he wrote them for me to read. And and then occasionally he'd test me to see if I was actually reading. He says, what would you think about that? And this is what was happening in that. And I'd couch it in my own terms. And he says, oh, okay, I know you're reading it now. He was testing <laughs> See if I wasn't just swapping it off and saying I was reading it. But no, I was I was reading it. So I followed the novel by page by page to the end. And this Baron Robilar is the Baron who had sent uh, Dunstan on his stupid quest, uh, not being serious about it, as you know. He was just going to you know, get rid of this kid, say, I'll go off and get the known cash, whatever, you know. And he comes back with it. So the the the, the uh, Baron Robilar, which is where I get my name from, um, mm -hmm. is from that novel. And 
and in the end, because uh, Dunstan wanted to be a knight. He really wanted to be a knight. And he figured if he could be a knight, if he brought back the gnome catch and the, and the Baron is so amazed by it. And he's thinking about how to approach the Duke and tell him about this land, you know, what they have done, what he's done now. He's claiming all the glory for it. And, and he's sitting around talking to the walls, preparing himself to go to the Duke. And finally, Dunstan says to him, uh, but I want to be a knight. You, you told me I'd be a knight. Uh, you know, talking about yourself. And this is where I insert my line at the end. And I and, and I said to Gary, I said, what you should do is just have him take out a sword really quickly and go, oh, bonk, you're a knight. And then he walks off. And that's why I contributed to the story, the ending point, bonk, you're a knight. <laughs> you know, we don't care about you. I don't care about you. I couldn't believe you actually did this, but now I'm cashing in on it. Sort of. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, Bonk you're a knight. Yeah, as much as it's worth. It's kind of a satirical look at the uh, if you look at it from Gary's point of view about the manipulative uh, barons and dukes sending people on their quests and stuff. And it really isn't very. It, it's heroic in the sense of what Dustin does, but uh, it it really lacks heroism. The realization of it at the end. You know when, when the you see the callous disregard of the uh, of the Baron. So, but when when we uh, when we finally roll up my character, I said, "Well, I'll just use Robolar. That's a great, great let's, name." So let's go here real quick, and that is to the Rogues Gallery publication, which I think is the first time you see Robolar. Right here, right. Everyone gets to see him at that point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You notice it. Uh, you notice the last line there. He's not at all pleasant if tricked. Um, that applies to me personally. <laughs> all right. So that is, all right. So. I'm in there. You, you don't. You know, I might also add that when. Robolar's history as he goes off to a place called Lynn. Uh, this is exactly where I'm at now. I'm in France. So uh, not only uh, am I living <laughs> legend of a player, but I'm doing the things that Robolar did. Nice. I am Robolar. Oh, uh, awesome. I've been exploring any jungles lately, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Gary railroaded me into that one. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, uh, I love here how it says you started as neutral and yeah. still remains an attitude. So, you're like LE with an N in parentheses afterwards if we do the, uh, you know, the style of, uh, of, uh, of alignment back then. But, uh, it says at this point, this is 1980s, presently lawful evil in alignment. So, and you're jaded with the everyday pleasures of life. So, um, you just, that's um, where, yeah. You know, the real history of Robillard is wrapped up in the play test. Okay. Uh, understand what the play test were. We're not playing a game. We're creating it. Right. 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 We're, we're not uh, playing in a world. We're creating this world, but we're doing it for the purpose of play testing the rules. And people wonder how we covered this so fast because we did it probably less than a year. Not counting, of course, uh, all the supplementary stuff that Gary and I made for from it. But we had to test out a lot of things. Uh, if we had sat there at zero level, first level for five months, you'd never see D and D. Right. The way, the, the way people play test, uh, play games these days, this is the way we play test. We had to run from top to bottom to see how things are working. Now, uh, at zero level on up. First level on up, and then we had to see how the alignment was going to work. If everyone's neutral, you're not going to find that out, are you? Uh, it, and uh, so we start testing the boundaries of this concept, which is the only way you could do it in order to establish a base for what people could understand that they could work from. So we had to go through all this. And a lot of these rules and attitudes are generated. So Robillard is a victim of the playtest, really. Oh, I, cool. decided, I decided to go 
evil because uh, Tensor had gone good. He was like one of the first good characters in the game. He started neutral. Everyone started in, new in a neutral area and started moving towards their gravitational axis and points. Uh, I decided, well, let me test out what evil will be. <laughs> well, he wants to be a goody two shoes. I can be a, a nasty little, uh, you know, Lord Evil Lord, and that's how he got characterized. But his his outlook was really neutral. Um, yeah, I did some evil things in in the game, what we consider evil. But so did Tom Champney playing the uh, his evil high priest character. He killed. Uh, uh, Ernie's secondary character, certain with a death, a finger of death. Oh, he was he was the real evil character. He had preceded me in the game by committing the first evil act, becoming the first evil character. And everyone wanted everyone in the campaign said, "Let's go get him." And then they all decided. Then they all went off in their own different directions. You know, no one ever ever got Tom Champion's character. They all talked about. Wanting to kill the bad, evil people, and they never did anything about it. So, the closest one was Don K, who traveled and searched down uh, Tom's character. So, but uh, otherwise, this goody, I don't like goody two shoes in games. I really don't. I want you to be out there and let's test. Let's. It's not that I dislike them or hate them. It's just I don't prefer them. Uh, I, I like to test the boundary of the concept, you know, and I still do, do so to this day, you know. Alignment can be a constraint, but it can also be one of those things where you say, hey, anything goes, you know. Who was Tom's character, by the way? A question from the audience came. Tom Champney played a priest at the beginning, and then he turned evil, so he was an evil high priest, as we used the acronym, uh, uh, EHP, and uh, and he found himself ostracized because uh, of doing that. So he was on. He kept on getting killed <laughs> uh, on the outdoor and getting raised and stuff. And then he finally went to Gary one day and said, "You know, shouldn't I get so many experience for all these deaths that I've been going through?" <laughs> Gary looked at him and says, "Haven't you learned yet?" <laughs> and that was Gary. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna fail downwards and get experience instead of a fail upwards. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, yeah, that was Tom. Tom Champney. Nice. Unfortunate occurrence of Tom uh, took his own life later on. Oh, I'm uh -oh. sorry to hear that. Yeah. Long. Uh, tragic story there which we won't cover but during the uh during the play test tom was very up on testing the boundaries of what the hell was going on with it too can i do this well it doesn't mean you should but sometimes when you're play testing and being rambunctious play testers you're going to so so rob is as part of that play testing with testing out the alignment and stuff is some of the magic items and effects that change characters alignments like the artifacts or the right. the the you know the the tomb of horrors chamber uh yeah. that you walk through and it changes your alignment and stuff like that yeah, well, is, the, is some the, of that the, part of that same phase you know you bring up a really interesting subject which is the artifacts because the artifacts don't start appearing until the third supplement Right. And most of it is this. I don't know. It was Gary's idea to always balance things. So if he's going to give away goodies, he's going to give away something that's going to impede your use of them. Right. And uh, so I'm not so sure. Uh, it has a lot to do with balance in the game. Gary was very big on balance and structure. And and whereas me, I was saying, well, you can make up the structure changes and balance changes as you go through this. So really, in the end, you couldn't structure the game so much or else you'd start getting a railroad effect uh, uh, of effects that would 
would have impeded the play test. So really, the structure built itself during the play test. So, so when you when you finally end up with it, you could say when we're finally done with it, and Gary says this is enough. This is enough for everyone to go on. Um, well, is that a structure? Really, what you're going to have is what he 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 pointed out during the alarms and excursions. And I'm, I know this kind of segues off of your question. No, well, it's, it's great. Please, uh, please Alan, go. Uh, who I was referring to. Because uh, I'm answering his question in a very long way. It's okay. Uh, we got time. The, uh, the idea of structure, in my mind, as I've written in my commentaries on this, which are unpublished, is that it's redefined in according to what you're doing in the game. Now, if we pre-establish structure up front, you don't have as much latitude, and then you have to say you have to go these directions. So it's the difference between granular and linear application of thought. And, and of course, we're now faced with the conundrum of adventure because uh, adventures are scripted and, and they are linear. Now, some of the stuff that takes place in them might be granular. Or it's just reaching a different point. But as far as the play test go, everything was very open. There was no structure to it. There was no uh, adventure praxis, what you could call or axis that should be uh, paid attention to because you're, you're dealing with the concept of what Arneson said to McGarry. When, when he described the fa fantastics around to him, he said, uh, what do you want to do? Now, we all know that this is impossible in a uh, monopoly game. You are faced with a linear structure of what to do. It, this mm -hmm. separates the two concepts into two different realms. So you get, to, you get to choose what to do. It was only when it started to reach more scripted vernacular that you started to close down the openness of, of achieving those points. Now, I know I rambled a bit, but it comes back to the structure to me and the game is the same as the structure was during the play test. It defined itself constantly, redefined itself by what the players were doing. And uh, as far as Gary's balancing of things, getting back in a long way around to Alan's question, I, uh, the artifacts were things that I suppose he looked at and he said, in history, you screw around with these things. You see uh, the, the history of literature, mythology, legend, these artifacts coming up where people doomed themselves. And you can even go to H.P. Lovecraft, of which Alan's very familiar with. <laughs> we all know what happens in a game of uh, Call of Cthulhu. And when you try to use an artifact, uh, they take it to the nth level compared to what Gary does, right? Or Gary did. So. <laughs> yeah. As far as as far as artifacts go, don't hand out the power if you if you're going to have to restructure the balance of them by using this give and take mentality. So. Well, I I love that the way the game's balanced. Though you know, well, let's not talk about newer editions, but one e. One through two e just always, but it's it's as a DM, you're always trying. You're always trying to tweak here, tweak there. You know, that's what I've been doing in my game for forty years. I imagine Alan and Anna, you do the same thing. Just so make sure that it doesn't go too far. Well, that's direction. the point. It's, it becomes yeah. very individualized, which is why my statement, I believe, is true that you you define and redefine structure yep. in the game. I mean, we used to. Uh, you, I had, when we were world, world building in the original campaign, I had a very big problem uh, with uh, dealing with linear, scalable things that tables apply everywhere, right? So I just went with an ad hoc system. I couldn't make hide or hair out of uh, trying to distribute this from here to China, right? and say everyone's going to play the same way, everyone's going to know the same spells, everything's going to be this generalization. So I'm already defining and redefining structure. You have to in the game. 
Because if I go from point A, at, uh, let's say America, and to point B in China, this is not because different cultures going to have different magic systems, different ways of th dealing with them. Now we couldn't describe that. This was left up to people who wanted to uh, redefine their own structure. So, uh, and so I think that uh, D and D in its best case scenario. Uh, just like World of Greyhawk as a symbol of it, um, as as a mode of of, of summoning fantasy and, and world building, it should have no shouldn't have sameness to it. It should have the distinction of of individualism, just like the original gamers did uh, uh, to create their own stuff. I think it's a nice skeletal thing, but once you start getting down to saying this must be this way it must be that way when everything can be all different uh, you, you have a much better idea of what the unknown is fantasy and what level you participate in it uh, as as a dm and a player great answer yeah i've noticed that that for me it's been like almost every like every decade i've played for like about 40 years now as as the rest of you guys except you Robert who played even longer but but for me what i need out of the game have changed as i have evolved in my life and also as i played I discovered new aspects that I'd never thought of the first decade I played, the second decade. Oh, now I want to do these things that I never thought of at first and so on and so forth. So the game have evolved both because I have evolved and also because I want to explore new new facets of the games that, that weren't there or even invented new facets of the game. And and I find that very appealing. That that's that shows how, how much depth there is to role-playing games and D&D &D, where you can actually invent new whole new ways of, of, of dealing with the game and playing with it and interacting yeah. with, with your friends and players. You make a good point, Anna, because the uh, idea of the game is to rise to the level that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. yep. There's some basic stuff we all must do. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's not just pure entertainment, though. When you start mixing creativity with uh your own personal choices and then the implementing it as a master for these people to engage with at their own level. We're yep. way beyond the concept of, of a state and, and a very structured game because you're in the realm of imagination. Where's it going to take you? It's going to take yep. anything. Mm -hmm. anything. Yep. So it's where you want to place your strengths in what you find interesting. And it is a self-evolving uh, conceptual system. Yep. Not only do the players evolve, you evolve, and then you raise up the thing, and they raise mm -hmm. up the thing. Yep. Even during the play test of the game, mm -hmm. we Gary and I learned this because they, our players, we not only kept our players on our toes, but they kept us on our toes. These yeah. are good players, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're going to challenge you. What do you want to do? What can I do? What if I do this? Then Gary yeah. and I to think up something for it. I said, well, we didn't think about that. We better address this issue. Mm -hmm. So it's some of it's self-evolving, some of it, and it's depending upon who's inputting into it. This whole thing is a big input-output system, really. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you input into it, you get an output, and then and then there's other things that circle around it that then say, well, what if we do this? Yeah. It's always and about what if. Mm -hmm. but, but one question to this, meaning we all of us DMs, when we play the game, we tinker and we make our house rules and stuff. What what were the process be? Meaning it, I can come up with my perfect version of D&D, &D, but it's one thing to make something that fits my own games with my players. But what how do you take concepts of new rule idea to make it into the general game that is going to be played by millions and become a, a commercial product what was your thinking back then about how did you go from oh this is a cool idea to something that actually made good rules in a good product that could be played well i cover part of that place. in my upcoming release which is called in the house uh-huh nice. covering the house rules what gary and i did yeah that. Understand, I'm not going to give away too much of this. No, story. no, but it teases. I have to yeah. survive as a writer, you know. Uh, the but the idea, the general idea, 
it's funny because a lot of these rules, which are initially house rules that we're using during the play test, because you can yeah. look at it like this, you play testing to come up with rules, but they had to survive mm -hmm. the in, in, in introspection and the inspection of, of the creators and the players. And on a larger scale, they had to be something that wasn't too specific. Yeah, because you're making a general game for everyone to move off. Yeah. Right. So uh, if you got too specific and it's like, uh, well, what up? You know, I couldn't even come up with a reason for it. But uh, I'll tell you for an example. But I'll tell you, anybody who uh, is more specific according to their world structure, there's a less chance of it being promoted as a general use item in 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 the general gaming sphere why because of the individualistic structured way you're doing things that are not always going to then be the same way as they're doing things we all understand that we can sit there and tweak the rules the mechanics and stuff that's just the support mechanism for uh possibilities and probabilities in the world uh to originate from uh, but 90% of what we do is conceptual in this. So when you get down to these rules, uh, yeah, they're kind of responding to your conceptual inquiry. Uh, uh, so when we we had, I'll give you one example. When we were playtesting, uh, Robilar went to China, and then Tarek and... Um, and Tensor followed him, and then we adventured home together, and then we split up. But during this time period, uh, Robilar was considered to have died. He hasn't been seen. Uh, no one's been seen. So my cousin, Gary, has a this nom de plume cousin come in to, uh, and take over my holdings claiming I'm dead and haven't appeared, and he takes <laughs> over. He's a first-level fighter. Nice. Well, he goes, he goes on an adventure in the Greyhawk Castle with this other group of people, Don Kay and Bill Corey. And, the, and while I'm absent, coming home from China, and and it, they stumble upon the, uh, the level in the original castle, not the one that Gary and I made, but uh, with, with the uh, gem trees and the giants. And and they get these gems, and they're dividing up the loot. I'm in the room because I'm playing the first level uh, punk punk ass uh, cousin who's taking my. <laughs> and um, and uh, Gary starts rolling to see if these uh, gems go up in value, and he rolled eleven ones in a row on this one gem. And it went up to like 100,000 gold pieces, the value of this jump. So when they divided out the loot, even with my small share as a first level fighter, I got 70,000 gold pieces. <laughs> and exactly. and, and uh, because of this runaway die that Gary was rolling for this one jump. And because of that, I got 70,000 experience points and went up seven levels. <laughs> <laughs> it might go. That's it. This is where Gary said that you're going to uh, now uh, rein that in by saying go up one level and one point away from the next. This is where that rule comes from. Right, right. Ah. You can't jump, so, double jump. Yeah. You yeah. can't go up like that. So this is where that comes in. So is it, but before that, it's, it's, it's assumed the house rule is that you can go up as many levels as you want, right? Until you get to this point where the house rules uh, prove to be inadequate to the uh, where Gary wanted to balance in the structure of it. So they really do start out as rules that are being tested to see if they're going to work generally across the spectrum and, uh, and according to Gary's design attitude. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, he want more balance and structure and people not going up all at once and really earning their chops. If he really would have done that, he would have gotten away from the gold piece system. They would have gotten some other sort of experience system. Because we, we use different experience systems 
in, in, in Greyhawk, which I will be discussing in this uh, cool. my next release in the house. Oh, looking forward to that. Yep. So, Alan, so, uh, Rob, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, that these are different rules that were being kind of tested out and um, some arose through play and got added to the game. What are some interesting rules that you enjoyed play testing that didn't make the cut into the final version of the game, uh, but that were ones that you thought had interesting potential, but maybe they were too complex to explain or it just didn't work out the way it was play tested? You know, uh, you always ask interesting questions. <laughs> and I'm and what I mean by that is that there's no straight answers to questions that Alan poses. Uh, first, I I don't remember any rules outside of the one that you're playing because we're just going in a structure of what Gary's saying, right? And how he because there's no rules to work from. Yeah, really, <laughs> obviously. So we start out with like eight to ten pages, and all the rules are created in the backwash of the playtest. People think he wrote a 100-page manuscript, and then, and then we play test it. That is not the case. This is in verse design. Usually, designers have rules, uh, and they come in and say, listen, I created this new game. Here are the rules. Let's play it. Well, that isn't the way it happened in D&D. &D. This is in verse design. Uh, you're creating these things as you're going along. This is the, the depth and the interesting particulars of the concept and this is why finally in the end gary says well this is enough <laughs> let everyone continue doing what they wish with this so really since you can throw them out and you can discard them or amend them anyway which is what he encourages that there are no laws that cannot be uh tooled with you're talking about basically a conceptual structural uh guideline uh, for you to go by and the things that made the cut as rules were the things that we understood as being constant like hit points and and he was checking for secret doors so that could change um, he could also change hit points you could do anything you wanted with it but basic a basic structure to work from in each case that's what it was but so i i don't have any real insight into that what what was what was lacking in, in upon reflection was a description of what i'm we're all now talking about it is is because to have a design attitude uh you have to have a philosophy you have to have a design philosophy or else it can't be applied as an attitude so uh the idea that we didn't describe what our attitude, what the philosophy was, and showed the attitude. Gary says, "Well, the laws can be changed, whatever." He's essentially saying that it's an open system. Uh, you can do anything with this. What was lacking was examples, uh, uh, a, a really fine point example of of this philosophy. This open systems philosophy is a toolbox that you can sit there and use according to your own. Uh, and this is a base guideline to go from. This is why some people are sometimes correct when they say D&D is not in its formative, a raw state was not really a game. It was kind of like a set of game guidances which allowed you to interface at the level that you thought was most interesting and, and more uh, forward thinking for yourself. It really comes down to this is why Gary was saying if people wanted to, once again, referencing the alarms and excursions, he says uh, people want to play a game of du dungeons and, and penguins or whatever and beavers, uh, go ahead and do it because uh, I'm not going to play God. These it rules... The, these rules are not uh, there to, uh, they're malleable. They can throw them out, you can re-amend them, you can tinker with them all you want. And that's what makes D and D interesting. Because unlike a game of Monopoly, where if, we, if you call up somebody in Chicago 
from Lake Geneva and say, hey, listen, I'm going to come down and play a game on a Monopoly. We all know the rules, right? But and, and at the beginning, and since everyone was house ruling and everyone was interpreting, there was a loose philosophy there, which is kind of borne out secondarily by Gary's quotes, uh, but is not definitively described. You have people asking us, uh, is this the way you later on? Is this the way you intended it? And I said, yeah, pretty much. You just do what you want. Right. And I said, good, because that's what we did. Yeah, people, when they ask questions on Ian World of Gary, would often kind of feel like he was just kind of saying, oh, yeah, you know, whatever you, you're thinking works. But they weren't getting no, his, because his, his agency and saying it's your game yeah. and your imagination. Yeah. Well, it's the point. It, it, I, in fact, cover that in one of my commentaries you bring up, that they couldn't get that they're asking him the very thing he denied he wanted to be, which is God. Uh, he's, they came to him, are you doing it like this? Let's check in. Because if you're doing it like this, this, this is a one true way of doing it. And that is so much crock. And he's telling him through his answers, he says, well, there is no really way. They can't see that his answers, they're looking for uh, specifics in a linear sense of structure where he's responding to them in a granular design view. And uh, they couldn't get it. They they just never got a definitive answer on it. But it's because the system became more codified and people started to say this is the way to play it. And part of that was, unfortunately, Gary uh, having a need for structure and competition in the market the and so forth he wanted to make it D and D and D and D is played this way and that was with the advent of AD and D but uh the but he never played it that way uh he had to write it that way because it was structured just like I have to do it uh when I create uh something now because the rules are so codified but I throw in different systems that work mechanically and mathematically with these things, which go beyond, which is adding on to the systems that already exist, which is more interesting. Gary did the same thing, but he, he, uh, he, so he'd write just like I write according to the rules, but he never played just like I don't play according to the rules. It's all restructuring depending on what is moving and what you think is important. Now, me as a DM, my uh, my my biggest import thing is one: keep the people out of game, keep them in the world, keep them moving in the world. That my first my first it just uh, is to bring everyone at the table out of their lives and out of the idea that you're going into a game. You're entering a world. Mm -hmm. right? And we did this, yep. we summoned this. And this is the, to me, if there's any advice I give a prospective DM, even those, uh, is to get them out of game. Because uh, you will end up walking up and down corridors, but you might as well be walking up and down uh, aisles at a Walmart. Because if, if, if you're going and say, well, we go to the door until we walk up the corridor, so the corridor becomes a conduit to get to the door, the room, to open the door, and we're now aisle seven where we get the soap. And this is not fantasy. This is not, well, we played D&D. &D. We had people scared to death, just like Arneson in his demo game had us scared to death. Good. Uh, uh, of, of treading in this unknown area, which you're describing. Yep. So uh, one of my biggest things is about maintaining fantasy in this new medium, because this is a new medium. It takes into account um, parts of literature, theater, film. Uh, your screen it, your screen is your mind, and it's being influenced by the verbal impressions uh, uh, of, uh, of what the DM is telling the player. Uh, they don't have, I mean, we didn't have all these blocks and cardboard cutouts and miniatures and stuff to push around. This was totally imagination. So you learn real fast to tell a story and to use elements from, from uh, 
literature, some of the best literature, so forth, the Hitchcocks and films, the and the Poe's. Or mm -hmm. can you can you can you summon that you're actually in a world, or are you walking down corridors waiting uh, for uh, the next motif to occur? And this is my biggest problem with the current game, yeah, because it's all about the rules. <laughs> And the system defines uh, a system is defined by the mechanics, and but it, yeah, in D and D, uh, when we were playtesting, sure we rolled stuff, but but ninety percent of what we were doing was conceptual. You were moving in the world matter. If you got up to a point where there was a possibility and you had to, and it was possible, then you moved the probabilities, and that's when the dice started throwing. Right, you start rolling the dice. Well, otherwise, are you world building or are you mechanics building? You now, these two occupied the same space uh, at one point. I'm not sure if they do any. For some, some of us, other, they do. <laughs> well, some of us. It, it, uh, are you, I remember we call this a fantasy role playing game. Mm -hmm. The first word is fantasy. Yeah. Right. And uh, we use this as a typology uh, to describe what we do. And it's really, about, if you separate out fantasy, role-playing, which is one word, and, and game, and you look at them from two, uh, three different perspectives of deno denotation, they don't make any sense whatsoever combined to yeah. what we do. So uh, really what we do is kind of a uh, conceptual uh, we're working with a conceptual imaginative system, you know, and uh, kind of like kids that play, except that we've added in adult knowledge and we've added in um, some such steadfast rules because kid, you just don't be, get to be able to say in Greyhawk, I go to Mars. Well, wait a minute. Uh, I think the kids playing in, in the yard. You got to you, you have to say, well, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to do that. Then. Well, let's see if it's possible when the probabilities come up. I, that's a yeah. whole story I could talk about for us. It's awesome. And cheers. Mm -hmm. I, so, how about I, I, go, ahead, oh, sorry. go for it? Go. Oh, I was going to say uh, that touches into a th something that I think is a, a center core part of, of the debate over how to play D and D and and other role playing games to this day. Meaning, some people they want a very game a crunchy uh, game style. They want to roll dice. They want to have pluses and they want to have structure rules, so to speak. And also organized play that we have these days, a lot of it, tournaments and 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 so on and so forth. That kind of requires that there's a lot of structure rules so you can play the game equally oh, yeah. at different tables but if you go to yeah, yeah. exactly and then you have the opposite saying that the, the opposite is like improvised theater with a little bit of, of scaffolding to 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 guide the things meaning it's improv it's come up with cool ideas and and portray characters and stuff that's the essential if you have a, a plus whatever that doesn't matter much so to speak and and yeah. and the indie is somewhere on this continuum from being chess with with lots of cool rules so to speak or it's being improv with a little bit of structure and you and know, and to me it's interesting to see and we, we we end up in different parts of this spectrum but it's somewhere on the D, &D spectrum or, or scale so to speak well yeah well it kind of tells you what this game is mm -hmm. it's a, th a thousand a million different variations yep mm -hmm. and and it's really not the game it's the concept itself the yeah. concept of engaging the imagination at whatever level comes up with all these other games and how you want yeah. to do it. Well, are the thespians are, are just acting out there? So, well, that's fine. That's what they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. We had that with White Wolf and, yeah. and somewhat with, with the Dragonland stuff. So uh, a, a, that's fine. Some people gravitate towards wanting to roll dice. They, mm -hmm. No doubt they say, well, this is just entertainment. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fine, too. But it, it can go every different direction. Mm -hmm. What I found uh, is that uh, in this balance of things, being a Webrin, I like to balance. It. <laughs> uh, I have an equal uh, regard for the crunch as well as the fantasy. I don't think they're uh, mutually exclusive. Okay. I think that as a good storyteller, in order to get you to these things which make the impact. Are you going to survive your decision? Mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, you're taking a risk uh, and you're taking it in a realm and you're taking it in a realm of this. Uh, what we do is in this realm of imagination is imagine imaginary things with imaginary circumstances. Uh, but yet, if if we treat it like that and it's just a game at that point, you say, oh, I can get resurrected or stuff. We never would have. We, we wouldn't have had people running in Greyhawk Castle away from what we, Gary and I can try for them. They were afraid for their lives. Yep. That's good. So this is the immersion. Mm -hmm. If you don't see these people scrambling through their rules and looking at their papers and ooing and eyeing and, 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 and confusion, when you finally get them to that point where they're now concerned for their character's life, you you you're now a master who's actually immersed them in the game. Otherwise, yep. you're walking down corridors. I'm sorry, in a Walmart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And, tacos. And, <laughs> I I I like the soap, please. Mm -hmm. I'll just put it in your cart, move to aisle eight. Uh, I, this isn't the way Gary and I did it. We had them afraid for their lives. Now, did we actually kill them? No, uh, really, characters tended to kill themselves. <laughs> that's the way. Yeah. That's the way your DM hear. looks at it. Yep, so they Jim Ward only says, no, but it's, yeah, yeah, I don't kill people. characters. Players uh, do. We, yeah. we would put out warnings for them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you're paying attention to details. Of, you're not paying attention to the slippery floor uh, with the wet sign in Walmart. And you yep. and, and hit the wet puddle that says, uh, don't walk here, it's wet. And you trip and break your neck. Oh well, <laughs> uh, we, we have we have warnings of things that we're not supposed to be engaged. Now this brings it back, or maybe being done at a different time or after cer certain circumstances when you know some more information. Well, you can't do that in a uh, in a scripted adventure. Everything in a scripted adventure must be able to be dealt with from uh, by comparing resources to resources. This is why, uh, uh, to this day, the DMs. Uh, and I'm criticizing my own my own stuff. I try to make more new new stuff for people to use, and more interesting systems. But really, I'm doing it within the confines of a scripted reality, and this is a challenge to make it interesting and engageable so that you can get back to some of the semblance of fantasy and the concern over working in these open environments, which we did in D&D. &D. There was no uh, mission adventure in D&D &D unless you said, I'm going to go down there and kill and find out what that was. Everyone created their own missions, right? So, uh, it, it, and that you could disengage from. Once you're in a module, you can't disengage. You're in a script. Uh, you can't go different directions. So the, to me, even though this comes out against what well, I do, uh, the, the best games would be the ones, maybe not the most memorable, but the best ones where you're actually all hitting on the uh, cylinders are the ones that are more open and structured by the DM of themselves, the DMs. Yep, I agree. They always will be. Yeah. So otherwise, and, you and any other people's imagination is great. Yeah. yeah and that, your you know, your adventures, that, though, they really yours and Gary's. The best of all of your adventures take uh, the adventure as a starting point and give you places that you can build from as a dungeon master and that you can build from during play. You know, if the characters dig out the tunnel in the dungeons under G1, you know, the dungeon master has to determine if the whole thing collapses or is there a whole new level there or what, you know. All sorts it's of like levels. in, in home, home, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, this like Homlet that, that I really like. It's written like you have these a lot of little building blocks in, in the in the right. town, in the village, and you can kind of, you can engage the players in any of these building blocks whenever it's, it's not supposed to play in any particular order. It's just a bunch of, of, of 
plot hooks spread out through the village yeah. that you can interact. And it also comes with little tidbits like, oh, this ties into that one in this way or this way. And then you pick and choose as the players, as the, the, the story unfolds. And I really like that way of structuring an adventure. Well, the uh, what what you're doing there is the elements, the uses of elements in design. Yeah, very understand uh, how to engage these elements so that they could lead. You notice that thing is written for campaign play. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hamlet is the definitive type of, of thing that is is going to fit in everyone's campaign at some level, mm -hmm. and because it's very granular. In the way yep. it's just like Greyhawk was when it was created, it's granular. He said, I this is all the information which wherever you go with it is what happens. Once you start structuring these design elements and saying this must happen, the, the that you're now outside of uh the realm of, of choice. Yep. And that's what a lot of people don't get about Hamlet T one through four. If you run just Hamlet and go right to the temple, it's not gonna work. You gotta fill it in. You gotta fill it in with side quests and adventures. It, 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 it was meant for campaign play. Yeah. Now that really yeah. denotes where we were at, you know, because everything we were designing was in a contiguous world that wasn't published yet. But the outdoor and everything was all relating back to the campaign. And and so you had to say, this is how it's going to be implemented. If you're going to send it along somewhere else, it's a tall order to say that my campaign will fit in your world, but the structure would. Uh, so uh, I think that these things should also be looked at, these designs that uh, Gary worked on and I worked on. Uh, should be looked at at the way you think. You get beneath the idea of the content and into the reason for it, which Anna was referring to, and and so uh, all three of you have that. So you get it, yeah. You know? Absolutely. Speaking of that concept in 1980, I got to get to this. I want to hear some stories how this came about. Ah, you know, and it's so time. What, and also, uh, your legendary events in the Eastern and Southern Flannis articles in the Dragon that kind of supplemented this in the years afterwards that you, you and Gary did. If you can give us a couple of anecdotes uh, or uh, some things that uh, highlights. I mean, it's just, this is what got me in the game. Yeah. Highlights about the, 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 the folio being released? Yeah, sure, about how it came together, how Greyhawk came together as the, the setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. I know well, it was... I understand at this time, I'm no longer with the company. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And and Gary's off on his own taking parts of things and putting them all together as World of Greyhawk. Now, that's not, not to dismiss it as, a, as anything. Uh, uh, it's really to dismiss that I have... Um, any great insight into that design. Okay. Uh, because it is an amalgam, as I mentioned earlier in this conversation, okay. uh, uh, of different things that he decides at some point that he's going to create this world. And it's partially, it's, well, for the most part, it's based off the Great Kingdom map right. with uh, things that have been changed. Uh, uh, or were glossed over when his version of the Great Kingdom map was lost by Chris Liker and Arneson redid his own version of it. We've seen pieces and, uh, of Blackmore. Yeah, we've seen that mm -hmm. map where, yeah. Well, we, it, it's obvious that Darlene, who drew the maps, uh, had to have reference, uh, had to have a uh, that map the eight and a half by 11 map, which was drawn in landscape by Gary and colored. And uh, in order to render the the maps there. So uh, obviously still a copy. I had a copy of it, which was photocopied, and I lost it. But we, 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 we got one copy from Len. He had a copy. So we got a copy yeah. that was made from that map. So his we, notes we have on it. So, exactly. But, we have a good copy of it. But the version that Len had is the version that became the folio map. That's yes. different than mm -hmm. the map you're talking about, yeah. Rob, which was the original Great Kingdom map, mm -hmm. right? Yep. 
we have photocopies yeah, of that is, images that, of that, that too that i think yeah. that is lost because uh gary uh -oh. stuffed the computer out of his file cabinet oh damn because oh. alan hammock showed us one and I, it's on one of my machines somewhere where the Great Kingdom smack dab in the middle and then Blackmore's over to the left and you have mm -hmm. some of the wild coast below, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that one. Um, yeah, uh, I'm grabbing that my, my version of that map. I'll cool. yeah. pull it up. So, Rob, you were not with TSR, but you're still writing for Dragon then? Because if because uh, you were yeah. writing those yeah, articles. I walked on good terms with, with, with TSR. Okay. And I was asked to stay involved and so forth. Gary mm -hmm. encouraged me to go back to and write articles and do design work. Um, the uh, so you know these questions should really have been asked of Gary. I think he answered some of them. Okay, that's fine. But uh, I can't. When you look at it, he, he just decides to render the world. It's not really based on the original campaign, you know, uh, because we weren't using the Great Kingdom map. We were using the abstraction of of of, of the uh, outdoor survival map. Okay. Well, later on, I started to implement the Great Kingdom map for an adventure for uh, Mark Ratner. Ilaric, uh, and had him go to the Great Kingdom. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess at the end, we would have been implementing it, so it took its course. But this divides uh, kind of like the stuff that we were working on and then updates it and leaves a lot of it behind that was my stuff. Because I was the co-DM. I was creating the outdoor and stuff. And then, and then when I left the company, I was a little bit soured upon things, and I was creating my own world, Calibron, and, and as I had been doing. But I really wasn't uh, creating a lot of Greyhawk stuff. He, Warren Kind's fantastic adventure. Gary had to strong arm me into writing that uh, uh, because I didn't. I really didn't want to write a module, and, and and so that's the way it was. I was, uh, everything that I did from that point was copyrighted by Gary and TSR. And that was a, kind of a, a bummer for me because um, I wanted to build my own brands and have my own futures and stuff. So, stuff. yeah, I contributed articles to the plan. So I don't want to throw water on your fire here. It's okay. No, uh, we, it's good to know the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. It's great. Uh, you know, that's good. It's a great thing. So, how about like Moore Castle? You, I, I'm assuming you were building that, building that, building that, and then they said we got to put it out, and that's how this Morning King's Fantastic Adventure came out in '84. Uh, have you, or, or is that a concept that you were building on beforehand, or because um, it's a legendary Eric, now? Eric Mona wanted to celebrate the 30th year yep. uh, of, of the 30th anniversary, and he had always considered the adventure iconic because it goes back and references one of the earliest adventures that was ever published. Yep. Um, Eric's great. Because this reference goes back to the play test uh, in 1973. Uh, but once again, if you look at it, you had to change it because uh, Gary was adventuring in our shared outdoor in this adventure. And and then when he, when we split, and he makes World of Greyhawk. I no longer associated our shared outdoor contrivances, my castle and everything that he was going into uh, for the play test as part of the shared environment. So uh, it's uh, he uh, we uh, especially at that officially ends the original Greyhawk campaign, right? Which is interesting because the original Chaos. Greyhawk campaign was based upon shared resources and shared area. Whereas then when Gary codifies this, this is no longer a shared environment. So I have a whole bunch of Greyhawk stuff that I for the original campaign. So go forward to more cast. It's based upon a 1973 adventure that is written up and put in there as well. That was appeared in Wargamer's Digest 
I believe the June or July issue. And in 1975, I believe Gene McCoy published it then. And uh, the, yeah, yeah, I see that. There that's, it is. Not, that's not the one either. Okay. Uh, yeah, Alan just shared that with me. So I got it out and I didn't crash the stream. <laughs> that's, that's the Domesday book map uh, that I then colored at some point, Rob. And that's Arneson's. Which is in between the two, right? That was earlier than the one you were talking about earlier. No, actually, it's later. Oh, okay. The, because Gary had sent the map to Schleicher to be published. Schleicher misplaced it. Arneson had to create it, another version, uh, which he then publishes off of Gary's notes. And the this the, that one had more words on it, more territory. It was more compact. It was shrunk down uh, for... I think Daniel Box yeah. may have it in his blog all right these, now. What, all of these words uh, are all written by Arneson. These are this is all his writing, and and uh, Gary's his is more compact. I should say there's more stuff going. There's more words. There's more kingdoms. There's more terrain. There's more everything. I'm gonna see if I can get on the on the. Dave's blog without crashing my stream, but we're gonna take. Do you want me to look? Uh, uh, here we go. I, I got. I think I can do this. I think I can, there. This should work. There we go. All right, let's try this. Let's see if how much I can blow this up. How about that one right there? That map. I know it's covered by some stuff. How's that one look? Is that it? Let me uh, center it. I know it's got stuff over top of it. I have to use a magnifying. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry about that. You can maximize uh, my uh, pick and zoom. You just put me as a point. But yeah, so it's got an IR div. I'm trying to blow this up as much as I can. I think you can click on it. Perrin land, Perrin land. Let me see if I can click. There we go. There Thank you, you go. Anna. How's, yeah. it? How's that one? I don't know. I see Anna. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Click on click on my picture and then just uh, highlight. Make that as uh, what do you call it, uh, Anna? When you make your picture, oh, you make, pin it. You pin, pin my it. pin my pick, and that should make that the biggest thing in Zoom. Yeah, and I'm gonna blow this up as much as I can for you. I you click on okay. on Jay's picture and you pin it. Yeah, keeps on, yeah. Keeps on flipping out. Yeah, just, yeah, there you go. You say pin. Pin, yeah. Right click pin. it and then uh, pin that pin and it. make that the big one. Make me the highlighted. Or, yep. or, or, oh, Matt. I see. Yeah. And that, how, yeah. So this is, this you know, is, go over to the right. It says Kingdom of Catmullen. Right. Yeah. Kingdom of Catmullen. Yeah. Right here. It does not show up in, in the, the maps that Darlene drew. Uh, it's dropped from that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kingdom of Faraz. Yeah. And, and I refer to Catman Lind in, in the rep, uh, of reference to that in in um, the archive, the all right K archive. So, so this we, version of the map is the Gary version, Rob, or that's still Dave's? It looks like an amalgam because that's really uh, Dave's writing. Okay. okay. It's is close it it's closer to what it originally came out, but Gary's was in color. Yeah, this was uh, this looks like a photocopy or some kind of copy, and this was came from uh, Daniel Boggs's blog, Golder on Two UC, who's on, in chat right yeah, now. You the Great Kingdom. Yep. Yeah. You know why it's divided into those parts is because those are the dimensions okay. of the officers and the and the people in the society who are, who are given that, and then you see those. Uh, Hash marks down to the uh, says Earl Waller. Yeah. That's Gary's demands. He was had uh, Plutonate status and and was given uh, uh, hash marks. He's kind of with the kingdom, but he's got Plutonate status. He kind of gets to call his own shots. Earl of Walworth. That's why it says Walworth there. Yeah, well, I, Walworth. I'm driving through Walworth County. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> This is where it all comes from, the Royal Walworth. That's so cool. Walworth County. 
So you think this is an amalgam? This is one of the older maps. It's a. It's still not that missing map, but it's getting there. Not totally. And and, uh, and it's not Gary's handwriting. Okay. So, so Anna, do you think it's worth showing the the lens map? Um, I, I I would say that that's probably closer. Because that's because but that's based on the folio. I mean, that's what the folio was based on was lens map. That's the version he. Yeah, had. exactly. That that I think that's the one that that Darlene got as the art order, so to speak, from Gary. Because it's uh, but it, there's some mean discrepancies here and there, but that was probably due to they have to fit it in certain format and and stuff like yeah. that that came in in the process. And I heard Darlene talked about the process, how she did the map and she the house she was sitting in and and how they went back and forth. So 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 I get it was that, but. That, and that is a kind of a, an evolved version of this and, and the doomsday map and stuff. So so it's kind of a yeah. get together. Certain things got squeezed out and, and, and they streamlined certain things, added bit here and there. But I also think it's part of what you usually end up in almost all the projects when you do fantasy mapping. You want a map that fits a certain format. And in this case, I think they had, they knew how it was going to be printed when the, the Darlene map came to be. They had the, the end right. format in sight and they wanted, we want two posters this size. And the order was probably to fill that neatly with water and, and land masses and stuff that actually fit those two panes of, or piece of paper, so to speak, posters really well. So I think that was part of the thing. And then we have that little anecdote when the Lindor Isles got cut. <laughs> but that was right. kind of a mistake that that is is to this day's bothers bothered Lynn all the time, so to speak, that 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 was it was cut. So to speak. but there's always a little bit of compromise. But I think that was a big part of the the reason that it was changed the way it was to fit the the publishing format, so yeah. to speak. That was I'm well, sure yeah, that I'm was one arguing, of the considerations. I'm not arguing about that. I'm just uh, uh, ascertaining the, the, the uh, provenance of this map. It's so you're saying, Rob, yeah. that, that the maps we've been looking at, the colored one and the one that Jay has on screen right now, those yeah. were um, different from the Great Kingdom map that got lost. And right. uh, okay. That, that it sounded substantially different based on yep. what you're saying. Yeah. No one in existence has that map. We don't know where it is. This map, this map it was actually a piece of art. This is in landscape like this, but it's colored all over mm -hmm. the place. Okay. There's, there's, yep. there's, uh, we have, there's we missed that one. Hills where there's hills and mountains where there's mountains and, and yep. the sea of dust. Put that. But it's got uh, uh, the printing on it. Because it's eight and a half, but it's very, it's, it's, there's more titles of all the title areas and including the Kingdom of Catman one. And uh, in this smaller print, there, you, Gary's not using okay. uh, uh, capital letters, which for hills. Right. Like the hills there. Uh, he's putting in hills. And if they have a name, he's naming them. Yeah, putting in brown pump marks to the hills. I there's a lot more graphics with this map. It's more of an art piece that Gary drew uh, compared to this is okay. more of a sum. Okay. okay. Anyway, that's what I know about it. Mm -hmm. And that that was lost, and I lost mine too. Yeah. What a shame. Yep, that's sad. But we, now Mark we know. Castle. Mark Castle. Or, or if you look on uh, look on uh, the Greyhawk uh, map, uh, Moab Castle. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, it's hard to. There's a couple things hard to pronounce. I know Narwell looks yeah. like Warwell, and you know, there's lot lots of. Somebody, uh, somebody mistook an R for a V. Uh, right. But uh, it, it basically, uh, when they had had me redo this for the 30th anniversary, I was very. I was very gung ho on it uh, because Eric Mona is a big Greyhawk fan, World of Greyhawk. But unfortunately, it, it didn't continue because Watsi withdrew the license and never contacted me about. I get questions about this to this day about Mark Castle. Yeah, there's a lot of fan interest in it. You created a wonderful framework to help people build, but they want to see more of it. Yeah, it, that's the pr problem, you know. Uh, 
Watch the control system. I can't do it. I mean, I could change everything. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm a novice here when it comes here. How does this line in the Al Raja Key archive line in with Mark Hassel? Just extra levels that are you've created, or I know there's a couple extra levels in in future dungeons that they have after this 30th anniversary. I saw them. There was like two or three of them that came out. Uh, so, uh, I've had to protect my intellectual property. I understand that, yeah. Because if you don't, you end up with Greyhawk Castle or Grey, the world of Greyhawk being owned and, and you right. get all the people who manage stuff that they didn't create. And so I successfully uh, managed to, by reiterating this twice, uh, one in for uh, World of Greyhawk, and then again for more Castle. You have iterations going on here. Okay. Which uh, essentially are there uh, to protect my intellectual property as well as give uh, people a semblance of what we were doing. The idea that the Moors <coughs> were from the uh, old Sul Empire and surviving. Uh, I would say I had started a story on them, in fact, about how they, the family evacuates the the, uh, the great disaster. What's that called, Alan? The, uh, invoke devastation. Rain a coverless fire and the uh, invoke yeah. devastation. Yeah. Because if you look at it, you know, who's going to get out of there? The, the strongest and, and the most magically inclined people are going to be able to jettison out of this place. And, uh, and and I had to, them aligned with that. And then in order to uh, further the line, which continued to be very decadent because they had to make sacrifices to maintain their youth. And what they had to do was to actually had to sacrifice themselves. And, and, and so they would grow decrepit, not wanting to uh, do that until one who was the eldest, the eldest always had to go first. And and then it became kind of like this power structure of trying to get people to do things. So it was a very intricate storyline as they're falling to pieces, they're worshiping all, trying to get ahead in time, figuring out all of these um, uh, other magics which might save them right, from this curse that they labor under in order to restore their youth. Who well, I happen to essentially get down to the last two people. And this is what the uh, more line was all about, a self-feeding vampiric family, which can only retain its life by sac sacrificing one of their ilk. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and so you end up in them trying to figure out ways around it by forming alliances with all these devils and gods and, and even going into the timelines to search for answer to their uh, for their unfortunate demise. You know? So uh, it has a lot of depth to it. I wasn't allowed to continue with this story. It really was very one of the most disappointing things I've ever dealt shame. with. As a storyteller, I consider myself an above average storyteller. <laughs> yeah. And and I learned it in the trenches of D&D &D, and reading and, and playing and telling stories. And this one was kind of inspired by not only Poe in the sense of the fall of Usher, but then you bring in the, the magic into it and all the, the other things. It's kind of like a advanced fall of Usher. Yeah. And, it's like Usher um, meets Clark Ashton Smith. <laughs> <almost>. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 Smith is very influential because he, he, he was influenced by Poe. 
but he took it to another degree of more of a stated debauchery than uh, or it was always with Poe was always inferred I uh, Smith stated he we are debauched you know Poe went for Smith stated so so and also H.P. Lovecraft did, did a lot of inference he was big inference too so Dickerus just posted in chat, nice, I'm using the Moral Bloodline in my Duchy of Ernst campaign segment. This is great inspiration. Yep. So there you go. Duchy still, of yep. Still. Is your campaign, you center on Ernst? Uh, this is, uh, and Dickerus in chat is putting that in there. Yep, that, that's what he's doing. He's well, got what's a, he, what did he say? He said, uh, I'm using the Moral Bloodline in my Duchy of Ernst campaign segment. This is great inspiration. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yep, absolutely. There's a lot. The great yep. thing about this com community, Rob, is, man, there's people that are just so creative and so much great fanon content is out there. Tons of it, uh, which is which is a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah. Alan, what questions am I missing for the Mar Castle discussion? Like, um, well, so Rob, you talked a little bit about the idea of, um. You know, multiple versions of Mar Castle. So you've got your original El Raja K Castle. You've got the version that sort of is talked to in Greyhawk and WG5, which you then expanded upon in the Mar Castle Adventures. You did create, you know, some additional material uh, during the Pied Piper area. You know, you did the Warlocks Walk Adventure back at Gen Con in 2007, and that mm -hmm. got published in the O Earth Journal. Um, so you, you did do a little bit of expansion and stuff for it, I guess. Um, and you've, you've hinted uh, in the Paizo boards quite a bit uh, around some of the, the Lovecraftian types of elements and such in the background uh, and talked about that in your essay in AFS, which you reposted on Facebook too. So did you, did you ever, I guess, uh, imagine a, uh, a finale or an end to the story? Uh, you know, Illuvia obviously comes in and uh, Illuvia Mar is uh, the per sort of the architect of the, the destruction of the family's yeah, uh, lands and such. Mar Castle is a cautionary tale because you get to go in as an adventure and find out about how this people self-destructed. I you get to witness the past and how, and you piece it together. In the end, it tells a story of the family by you participating in their insane environment. And that was the, the ending point of it. This is, this, is a, this is a doomed family. And, and the reason that you're coming in there <clears throat> is because this is what they did. I mean, you had Eli Tamoris raiding their secrets. And now people are following Eli and finding out why he's down there doing that. It's so rather, it may not be in the sense of like, oh, well, this is a mission venture. We got to do something here. This is a, this is a fantastic story with elements where you're involved in it. And it's just like everything else. It's just like Poe. It's just like Lovecraft. Uh, all these people were just by the when, especially in Lovecraft. He, 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 they're just way, uh, bystanders that happen to come in on the destruction of something that's going on. So, uh, and, and so what, what's the end point? Well, you find out a lot of things about the Moor. You find out that they're time travelers. You find out their history. Now, once again, can you uh, strong arm that? Can you can you tweak that into a campaign? Yep. There's enough elements that you could actually use it. But uh, it remains something that is not a mission adventure, really. It, it, I don't like mission adventures. Uh I like things that are campaign oriented and uh, that uh, even if in the end you find out why they're, because when you're entering here, most of them are already dead, right? right? They're dead and gone. 
uh, Oluvia is one of the few survivors. Uh, she's going to be dead. She's being hunted by the thing she can't she can't outdo us is her, her own mortality. She's going to be dead. They're all going to die because they 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 lived. Uh, they gave their essence to others, and now it's all being taken back. And this is what you see: this trail of destruction. And piecing together the trail of destruction is piecing together the story. And uh, that that uh, they aren't mutually exclusive; they're the same. It, you you gotta you gotta really get into it. I think this is why people liked it because they wanted to understand the mystery of the fall of this family. Yeah, the, it, it's like it's a giant set. The, the entire dungeon is a giant campaign set piece in a sense. In the same yeah. way that the little set pieces in the castles are are evocative to hook you in. Yeah, I just spread it out over the whole series, and and. And you're going to have crazy things, you know, like the artifacts and stuff that they find. And, and they're dealing with it. Can you deal with them? Can you understand them? I would have worked in the time splice thing that where they uh, essentially, I had them go. Uh, Eric Mona and I talked about doing Lost City of the Elder, but I couldn't get him uh, to, because uh, this would, this figures into it, because they get to the Lost City of the Elder. Right, but then they're followed back. They leave a trail, right, and this is how they're discovered. And and but we it came down to renaming it Lost City of the Ancients, and we just do your thing. And I, but you can't obscure content. I'm very specific with my content, and it's related to things. And I wanted to have creative control and keep the copyright on it, and they wouldn't let me. Now I'm not criticizing Paiso. It's a, it's a, one of the most professional companies I work for, and but I didn't want to give up my copyright, right? Right, and and you know because I if I'm forced to I could tell the story in some other way. Uh, every time I, I attempt to do these things, it comes down to you want you want a good goddamn story. You want you want a great enthralling thing. Why do you want the copyright? Why do you want to own everything? You know? And uh, I, so I've been a hold on that. And I think this will disappoint people that I should bleed to these uh, these people who want to own things and so they just want to publish something that's good, like finish more castle. Well, but that gives you now the ability to tell that story in some other fashion in whatever context you can do if you want yeah, but because you because you kept that ip yeah. well yeah for what you know i'd rather just told the damn story so yeah. rob Ann and i are doing something with troller games and i'm keeping rights to everything right to my free city of Alta yeah, I, I kept my rights to the troll or stuff while i was dealing with gary yeah the trolls are good people Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that Dark Dru Druids is up there too right now. Yeah, so uh, I kept the rights to Dark Druids. They, they don't <clears throat> I'm not talking about the trolls. They're they're good chaps. They're yep. good people. Okay. Cool. Uh, we're cool. talking about all these people who are doing you a favor. Uh <laughs> I have to brush brush to their shoes when uh, I design the shoes. You know. Yeah. Uh yeah. you know, you know what I'm saying? No, uh, and, no hundred percent. I'm bitter. No. It's reality. Uh, it, it, we now have a bunch of people who own this game and everything, and they don't care to hear about the past. And they, and if you want to interface with them, they're, they're, they'll gladly do so at their convenience and at, at your, your at your pain level. And so, uh, and, and it's just it. It's kind of like if you look at D and D, and Greyhawk is part of casualty on that as well. Um, uh, it's kind of like the the Titans being vanquished by the gods. You know, they're now kept captured out of the way, cave you know, beneath ground. Hephaestus is on an island somewhere making statues. And and you got all this stuff. The, the the Titans were were vanquished. I'm one of the old Titans. I they don't care to hear from me anymore. I've been banned to hell or somewhere. 
We Maybe. resurrect Titans here, though. This well, one would hope so. This <laughs> community is going I strong. Older. I mean, I'm 67. And I've been to endeavoring now for what 50 years mm -hmm. in this industry. Yep. I don't that's have awesome. a pension that's helping me. I I, I write to to live. Yeah. Well, yes, trust I mean, me. No, it, I don't. I don't it, eat. After this discussion, everyone's already saying in chat, well, you got to have Rob back again like like I have Ed. I think I agree with him on every other month on a talk show. So, uh, and all sorts of people, Jim Moore, Jeff Grubb, uh, the whole crew. So, we got to get you on uh, absolutely a lot more, Rob. But can we take some uh, a couple audience questions? They've been asking. And they've been patient. Would that be okay? If we took Ooh, a couple? I, I'm here. Okay. It's, Sounds good. The one that was intriguing me was uh, so, uh, Alderaan, I think, asked this. And he's the one who linked the McGarry map. Um what uh, influence did Mays, Weibel, and other women have in the play test? Were they were they female play testers? Well, you know, it, this is very prescient. Uh, there were no uh, there was one female play tester, which was Mary Dale. Okay. Right. And uh, it's interesting about that because I just yesterday talked with my wife about. Uh, Write, writing a, some matter as a project for the forgotten women of D&D. &D. And, and uh, I just mentioned it yesterday, and now was his Alderaan from the, the his, uh, isn't he the Blackmore dude? Yeah, Do uh, Daniel Box. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry if I don't remember everyone. That's okay. Right. That's okay. We well, don't remember everyone. Oh, yeah. the Blackmore dude. <laughs> Dan Box. Dan's a good he's guy. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. I yeah. know, I know. Uh, he he uh, interfaces a lot with uh, the uh, secrets of Blackmore people. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, Mary Dale. Okay. But she wasn't a constant player. Okay. Um, she. Uh, Ended up marrying Tom Champany, and I, I will be discussing that in the Forgotten Women of D and D. But most of it was aimed at Mary Gygax and some of the artists. Okay, of the artists. fantastic. Yeah, and you you had um we we chatted about this not that long ago on Facebook in the last couple of years. Uh, you, I think you mentioned that Deborah Nafsinger had also played a maybe a paladin in your campaign. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Deb Napsiger, which was uh, Mike Menard's old flame, and lived together, and in, in, uh, and it was the latter part after we had published the rules where she had a paladin here. So there's stage. I can describe the waves of people since I was there. And uh, so it's kind of like a 75 when we're still playing the game. And they got me to come up to Minnesota, and I took Cap Square out up there for three weeks with me and, and DM'd up there, their groups and stuff. But then, then occasionally when they get back in town, I'd, we'd DM or, or play a game or something. And she played ballet here. Yeah. Deb? Cool. Yeah. Uh, Nassiger. But that was in 75. This was during the play test. Yeah, that was definitely Mary Dale, Mary Dale was there for the play test. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Gitano asked uh, about your, uh, and I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced these, Wolfer and Drystaff. Are you going to continue anything with those? Well, ask Alan about that. <laughs> All right, Alan. <laughs> that came right. from uh, guitar. Never mind. I won't play pin the the, 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 the tail and the dry staff. <laughs> um, the uh, unfinished novel that's been, uh, well, it's finished, but it's unpublished, excuse me. Okay. Yeah, that has been edited twice, and it's a, it's a uh, send up to Jack Vance. And it just says all my dry staff was. Dry staff started out as a, this is for people to know, uh, 
in strategic review number six. Wow, pre pre dragon. And, and, and the quest for the million volume. Except that it was supposed to be a one off story. My first piece of, of published fiction is satire. And because it is aimed specifically at Avalon Hill and SPI, who were bitching and moaning about the National Convention and whether Drencon was the National Convention or whether they would come out with origins in the future. And, and they were poo pooing us about uh, publishing D&D. If you think about it, it's kind of like Gandhi, you know, uh, well, he says, first, 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 they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they uh, attack you, then you win. This is, uh, this is very similar to well, when we published T uh, d and and we're promoting the convention as me as chairman. And, and uh, they were pissing and moaning about it. They didn't like the idea. First, they ignored us when we sent it in and laughed at us uh, and said, well, this thing won't last on game shows. Well, this hasn't got enough structure to it. And we don't understand this model. And uh, so they poo pooed it and sent it back. And Lowry, who Gary was the game editor for, um, had a better reaction. Don was always a gentleman. Uh, and he just didn't want to publish it. So even, even though Gary was the game editor, Don couldn't see either. Everyone's attached to these models, which might tell you something about this game. Uh, this is not a the model that existed beforehand. Why? Because it wasn't the same system. And, and because you cannot have somebody not recognize this thing without it not being exactly what it should have been, what they were assuming it would be, because it doesn't have enough structure. Who was that guy who did Arnold Hendricks, who did the... Uh, he was saying, if you look at Arnold Hendricks' review of D and D and the Courier, I think it was the Courier. Yep. Um, and he uh, said, you start looking at the key words of this, and he's saying, there's no, it needs more regulation. It needs more. Uh, the there's, there's all these key words which are into linear thought of structure, this and that. This is the total opposite of. So this is why they didn't understand it. It didn't fit the needs of the model. So they laughed at us, Avalon Hill. And then they attacked us. Uh, well, well, first they ignored us, then they laughed at us. They made fun of it. Oh, this stuff won't last on bookshelves. Oh, well, fantasy. What's with, even Wesley was saying, what's with all this fantasy coming back to Arneson? And that was happening before. This is the total reaction of the war games, of the very serious simulations uh, uh, movement out there. Uh, this is all elves and dragons. What are you doing? You know, when Wesley came back from leave, you know, to see what the, what the, uh, that Arneson and his group had done. And and now we, uh, they had, so I wrote this article and I used it as a, a fulcrum of a satire to satirize them. I have that. SPI is the spy in it, and I have, I have the, uh, I have uh, uh, the witch who sends uh, uh, dry staff on the mission to find the missing tome, as it was uh, made the Vermilion volume. Her name is 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 uh, Avalon, which uh, is Avalon, right? Uh, 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 of the Greenwood, because John Greenwood was in charge of, of Avalon Hill at the time. Avalon of the Greenwood, uh, who lives in Hexagon. Uh, of course, they're known for their hexes that they use on their on their uh, on their board games. So uh, it was a complete satire about how at the end how they lose this thing, and then finally in the end. They come out with their own game, their own fantasy game. I think it was Mold Bay, right? 
who uh, did it for him. Somebody yeah, they, he did the um, yeah, it was Molde. He did um, Lords of Creation with them yeah, after, after Creation. he got laid off. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, it, so finally they say, you know, uh, they say this thing won't last on game shows. You people are silly. Uh, uh, then we attack them, and then they then imitate us. Yeah. You know? So that's what you get from Avalon Hill. That's what that story was about. It was a one-off. And I decided to uh, then make more into a, uh, or less into the Inspector Clouseau bumbling uh, wizard that he was. So he precedes this other, uh, this, this, there's another published wizard out there who's a, who was written by this uh, Terry somebody or whoever it was. Uh, but I preceded him with the bumbling wizard uh, dry staff and but, but I changed this whole thing of being uh, um, affected by a spell that his wizards and his cabal set up for him to go off and and uh, get this gets his I rewrote the story as getting the tome and they set him up and he's affected by Atakar's heinous negation orb which affects his memories and he doesn't know who he is or where he comes from and they they set him up to be affected by this Atakar's heinous negation orb uh, otherwise known an acronym as the great oh no <laughs> <laughs> nice and, and and uh he's he's now lost his bearing. He doesn't know his name every time somebody speaks his real name, it translates as dry staff, which is the name that they give to him. Oh, and okay. his identity yep. and his history. And along the way, he helps a lot of people, but he can't seem to help himself. And uh until cool. the, the That's novel. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. So uh Alan, let's go over some of the new uh, what's coming out or that's been out for a couple of weeks. I'm talking about the Red Books. Yeah, yeah. You should have definitely Rob introduce them and talk to him. Yeah, let's. Um, so I have this. Uh, I have uh, multiple ones. Here's the Red Book Premiere. Does uh, that start them off? I have Red Book Premiere, Red Book Gargax, Red Book Price. Does that's that a poster. There. Excuse me? That's a poster. That you're that's the poster. That's like the ad poster? Okay. So then we have uh, volume one. Correct. Gargax's glorious Gugos. I do love alliteration. <laughs> and and uh, as you notice, I get around the name by putting right because of the yeah, I, yeah. I understood. No understood. one wants me to talk about Gary, uh, but in here. We have an expansion of reasons why it's worth talking about preserving his legacy, and and whereas the Gygax estate isn't preserving their legacy, his legacy, they're letting it rot. And there's not anybody who seems to be talking about Gary's legacy these days. So I thought it'd be nice to go back in the 50th year that we all sat down the play tests to say we weren't just names there was actual things going on thoughts and, and matter and then do a send up to gary we're having uh taken all that matter and turned it into what we call uh, a commercial role-playing game which uh, seems to have changed the world there should be more people who remember and and do things for them uh and but that's it they're send up items as well as the influences which uh, inspired him to write D and D. Some of them. Okay. So that's so, uh, that's volume one, and then volume two, I think is this red book. Price is price. Uh, yeah, it's a send up uh, to a lot of people, but mostly to Roger Corman and the film The Raven, which really influenced Gary. You okay. see, you read. Gargax's glorious Gugos, and you go to the Raven part of it. It's much more than just the magic missile spell and, and the shield spell. There, uh, and you now have to start thinking 
that the person who wrote the script for the Raven was Richard Matheson. He created the system that they're using in the film. And then Gary's kind of borrowing from Richard Matheson's script. Right? It comes out as being portrayed as a film, but it's Richard Matheson who, who writes the script and is describing the magic system and how it works amongst these three dueling wizards in the in, in the film The Raven, which is always worth re-watching because you 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 catch all these nuances of things in it, like uh Price's character, uh, Vincent Price's character, uh, uh, Craven, and, who's a wizard, uh, is turned to stone by Carla in, in, in the movie as he's rushing out and he's turned into a statue. So there's all sorts of things in there. But this is a send-up to that movie. Plus, I do some other send-ups in there as well. And, and it's 31,000 words, and it's very highly engaging. It took me, the way I wrote the manuscript for this, I, it, just to talk from the design view for a second, is that I was trying to come up with unique, uh, every encounter is very unique. Right? Every, there is no slough off encounter here. Right? Everything's unique. And since I was also doing a tribute to uh, uh, Fritz Lieber and, and Jack Vanson here. I got to the, uh, I, I couldn't think of anything for Vance to do. And, and so I kept on letting his key kind of float until I came up with an idea for him. And then I finally got to the end of the manuscript and, and I was left with his key, right? His key 14. And, and, uh, I still hadn't come up with anything. I spent two days laboring uh, in order to do a send up to Jack Vance properly and finally came up with an idea that didn't seem mimicking of the past, uh, somewhat comparable to some of the other things that are in there. It had to be unique because Jack Vance was unique, right? So uh, yeah, two, two days. I uh, labored finishing that, uh, just thinking up what to write. I love the bottom so, line. It says an unpredictable and challenging first edition adventure for quick thinking adventurers, <laughs> levels nine to eleven. <laughs> yeah, there, if you look at the back cover of that, which is more explanatory. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that, but that's okay. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it really starts asking questions about. And kind of in the way that I posted, uh, it, it, it asks you questions about what what is this and what is that and what is this. He's exposing all the matter in there. Cool. Much more interesting than the front cover, which is just an eye catcher, uh, because it explains the matter. And quite honestly, it, it, these people are going to be asking, "What the hell?" Like I said in the back cover, "What the hell is going on down?" Here? This thing is so bizarre uh, and so engaging that I can't imagine anybody not having fun and not pulling something away from this adventure. And that's the best I could do in, in the sense, because you're not going to go on a celebration of an anniversary by just saying, ah, here's something. You know, it, it, it's a very meaningful starting at that time and still being alive. And Here we go. Talk about the sources. That's that TLD. Yeah, and that's where we got the El Raja Key here, and we got the Red Book line here. Dave Arneson's True Genius. Let, 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 not, let, me, let me be very point blank. Hmm? The Red Book line, the TLB Games was a uh, set up by Paul Starberg and myself mm -hmm. to sell my items, which were being published by us. That I was putting up the money for, and and, and it, he would then distribute them. So, uh, but the Red Book line as it stands is is probably not going to 
continue in print unless I find somebody who, who publishes at a clip of greater than uh, one quarter of a product a year. And and uh, so I've gone to PD up with it okay. because uh, I'm getting a little old and I can't wait around for people to publish my stuff. And, and it, if you want this stuff, it's not going to be published in print unless I find somebody who wants to actually get serious as a publisher. I, and right now I don't have somebody like that, you know. So, uh, and so you're going to have to just accept what I have. And once all that stuff is done up there, it's all, uh, that, that's the end of uh, TLB Games because I'm not going to, uh, Dave Arneson is out of print. We're going to be releasing that. Dave Arneson is true genius. So we're going to be releasing that in PDI. Um, all the stuff that's done up there, uh, I can't reprint because... I just don't have the money for it and or the wherewithal dealing with this uh, licensing thing and stuff anymore. So it's kind of a bad and good thing. LRIJK Archive, when it's done, will be uh, put out as a downloadable product. Will no longer be a collector's edition type of stuff. That's not, everything's going to be going. Okay. As I consolidate uh, my my IP back into a place where it actually is being managed instead of letting the rot. So well, hopefully it doesn't sound uh, too, too ominous, but uh, no, I, no, you're being, you're being bluntly honest, which is great. Right. Yeah. Well, not, well, maybe uh, it hasn't gotten me too many uh, kudos in, in, in the past for being blatantly obvious, uh, honest about things, but, uh, but dealing with Robel, are you, you, you I, I <laughs> I just come out and say what the hell's on my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no one who's guarded in this. I certainly am not. I've had people say things that are totally true about me. When I talk about contracts, I'm talking about stuff that, that needs to be uh, listened to or else or else not. So yeah, the line, the line is not only a celebration of, of those days. I will with the Red Book line, I'm going to continue uh, with the help of my fans uh, and start going forward. We're not. We're starting at 73. I'm going to start stepping forward, 74, 75, and about 76 uh, with the last supplements and what was going on and start covering the history and the influences all the way up. So it's going to. St it starts at 73, mm -hmm. and then we'll finish about the time I leave TSR, and about that time uh, maybe I'll be retiring. I don't. Uh, permanently. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what's around the corner. I'm still breathing. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah, and we're always happy for that. It's yes. Not to, it's not to uh, forget. But we, we are now being managed by a bunch of people out there who, who don't tend to... I've never been interviewed for books or for these places, and they are tend to telling a short end of the story about this. Uh, and you can sit back and say, well, that's just the way it went. And we're now just all anecdotal people. And, and just like Ray Hawk is now this anecdote, according to the news being held in the Tower of London. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, essentially, or you can sit and speak up. So I'm speaking up. I don't care who likes it or not. I really don't. Care. I think everyone here, we have over 100 people watching right now. Rob. Yeah. And I think they love it. So mm -hmm. just know. You know, I it was this one time uh, Gary was interviewed online. It was this place, Silver or something. I can't remember the name. And he published the interview, and then somebody came up there and started hacking on it. Right? It's really a uh, guy gags this and guy gags that, and they're just hacking the shit out of them and stuff. <laughs> well, I dropped him an email. I said, you know, you got this weave up on you know you know hacking the shit out of you up on i just so i warn you in case you want to go up there and do anything about it or, or say something and 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 gary wrote back to me he says you know rob i don't i don't give two pieces of coon shit what people think about me and so i'll use that that's a good one you know 
I don't give two pieces of coon shit what people think about because they're always going to hack on. It doesn't matter. Just like Gary said when he created, he says, you can't satisfy everyone with these rules. He says, I could have, I, I would have, I could have gilded them with gold, gilded them and made them gold uh, pages and gold covers, and they would have complained how heavy they are. You know, so uh, yeah, it, there's no pleasing everyone. So I just think I'll just say what's on my mind. Yeah. Truly. I'm all, my wheels are already turning here, Rob, down the road. Yeah. I, would, I would love a discussion at some point down the road. The adventures of Lord Robler, just to just tell the stories that happened. Oh, oh yes, yeah, we will, yeah. That oh would be my, awesome. What to, color to, was Robler's brown horse? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> to Mahars, I yeah. use all of it. I mean, my I have gosh. One, uh, yeah, I go have for one it, question. I want to yeah. to go. To, I want to to cater to before we we stop today because that that is really cool and it's in here. It's not in the adventure. It's one. This one module has a whole bunch of appendixes, and in Appendix mm -hmm. B, the Dark God article, it makes some really cool associations that that I missed the first time I read read this. That I think is really cool for for a broad audience in D and D. Can you kind of indulge us on the 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 connection between Thoriston, the Hero fans, and and TLG and version. and the Tarasku? the Tarask in, 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 because you link them together here and it is really, really cool. Can you please just indulge us a little bit or tease us with that? Well, you know, I was building this whole, whole idea of how Thurston would be captured. You know, supposedly he comes to the planet, all the gods align against him and the god of magic and everything. And somehow he's captured. Well, uh, so I'm elaborating. On that. Uh, the Tarask is, is is part of this. It's it's impervious creature, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, and uh, the poem really says it all, really. And if you look at uh, I don't remember all the nuances. I no, no, but it. yeah, whatever you can remember. Yep. Well, no, that's the point. I was drawing the conclusion that it had the Tarrasque. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but it, you know, you you get to look at the module. I have it here if I could look at, but I can't remember everything I put in there. No, but, no, 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 no. It's just that, if you have some some anecdotes. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm working. Uh, I came up with the idea for Thursday one. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a page and a half. I give it to Gary and say, hey, look what I created. And the next thing I know, he's making the Temple of Therist and then thanking me in the in the credits. Wait, wait, you created Therist and I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Therist Duan, as I named yeah. him. Wow. Uh, yep. And, and uh, so we now have two development paths going on, right? And as with so many of your works, <laughs> the, uh, the, the IP work and the real story. Yeah. And, well, it, it, you know, Gary decided he liked it so much, he decided to use it. So, you know, what am I supposed to do? He's no longer, uh, how do I, how do you write things that are, are yours to begin with that, that somebody else takes and does uh, something else with? So uh, this is just kind of a, a little, my say on what it, I would have done with it. And, but it, it doesn't have the gravitas even though I came up with the idea. Yeah, you know, so uh, uh, so I don't know what to say about it. You know, it's like more castle. You know, it, it's, it ends after a bit, and you say, oh, there goes another thing. You know, I have a lot more ideas. I'd love to answer Jay's questions and be involved with more stuff. Uh, I'm just hoping to, to live to the next paycheck. I understand that completely. And just so you know, Dark Druids, it's incorporated. Uh, I love the sub. There's two sects, S-E-T-C-T-S, -T -T oh, everyone, yeah. it, within that. And uh, I have that incorporated into my uh, Gnarly Forest Wild Coast area. So they're all yeah, it's a great. It's a great. If you think about Dark Druids, you come into a situation that you can, is fluid. Mostly you come into static situations. There's nothing going on. 
and 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 you have to figure it out and you know, how to get through the resource versus resources. Mm -hmm. Here is the fluidity uh, allows them in. There's there's this uh, there's this uh, you know who's who and what's what and what's going on here. So you have to understand your environment. It's not like are in the castle to kill the big bad guy. Uh, we know our environment, right? This is more fluid. It's more chaotic. Mm -hmm. You're not sure what's going on. If you side with one and defeat the other, are you doing the other one a favor? Or, you know, there's all sorts of nuances built into it, which makes it living. It's a living adventure. So uh, this is distinguishes it. From it's, some other. It has resources in it. That you can place in your resource. campaign. That's it. It's resource driven adventure. It has the Dark Druid class in here. It has all sorts of great things. So it's, yeah, it's fantastic. It's got uh, all sorts of new stuff in it. It's, everything's new. Yeah. It's one of the, new, this is the hallmark of why I try to create the unknown is to keep things unknown, you know, new. Uh, so uh, the day I stop doing that, I'll be a dithering little fool. A, a bottle of beer at a bar and saying, oh, I used to be great. Uh, <laughs> Understand. Yeah. yeah. It, there's no well, past I'm tense there, Rob. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have that... fertile imagination. You know, it's whether I can impregnate it. Alan's questions have been like genius today. Alan, uh, yeah. wrap this up with a question. Yeah, for what, Rob. What, what the Kenny Loggins look? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. This this is my homage to you. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yep. You got a grayer beard than I do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what do you think? Mark. So what do you got, Alan? What do you got in a wrap so, up here for Rob? So I think um you mentioned a little bit, Rob, about uh, you know, the House Rules book is something that's going to be coming out after uh, the two pieces you released at the beginning of the month. And you're going to have some new titles coming yeah, later in the year. There's a thousand words written on it right now. It's probably going to approach probably close to 30,000. Nice. So what else What else do you have coming for the anniversary celebrations that you want to kind of tell us about to look forward to? Whatever it is, I get to celebrate it. <laughs> It, it, it's whatever I think is best uh, that would fit at that time. Uh, okay. quite, quite honestly, what I got, you know, what's 74? It's January. Let's be very particular about January. Oh. Uh, because that's when D&D &D was published. Right. January. So, so really what anything from 73 counts. <laughs> uh, you only got a few days <laughs> to 74 to call it, but it was published in the year 1974. So uh, let, let's just keep it within the realm of reality here. Uh, when we released this thing, uh, we were pretty much the same as what we were. You know, we had spread around the rumors about it, and uh, we hadn't picked up that many people. It was mostly coming word of mouth. We weren't in any stores, right? And uh, that would come later as people started to promote it and started to get out there and word of mouth it around campuses and in game groups. And uh, I'll, I'll do a fitting setup for it. I'm not sure what it'll be, but it'll be something congruent between the leapfrogging from 73 and as we rushed it into print. Uh, just the... It, just to get this concept out there, which we, which Gary admitted probably wasn't finished. Well, I'm not sure. Um, it could have used a little bit more, but as it is, it seemed to have done okay to me. Yeah, certainly created quite a tsunami out there, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We felt to this day. Yeah. They, even by old codgers like me sitting around. I used to be great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to laugh at yourself in this industry. If, if you, uh, and take the bars that come from it, too. You know, so, so uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, Alan, just to answer your question, but it'll be something uh, very respectable. 
No, looking forward to it for sure. I, yeah, I just didn't know if you had other specific things in mind. That's all. Because I know you'd said in the newsletter that, uh, you know, you were going to try to um, have more ways to help drive the celebration uh, throughout yeah, the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not getting a lot of responses yet. It needs to be proliferated a bit more, I think. But the idea, I don't want to brag, but I started out making Gargax's glorious you dogs. I think I describe it in the introduction. And then I moved to the second, uh, just to do send up items. And then I moved to the second section of the influences. Then the influences on the items become inseparable from the game as we play test it. So I have to describe all those things. And as I'm doing that, I'm saying, well, this price thing with the Raven, the recharging the Raven, that could actually be made into an adventure. A, a small one, I'll have the DM make it. Ah, that's too easy. I'll do a little bit of a six-encounter adventure. And uh, it, it, just so they got something to do, put on a little map in it and stuff. And then it, and I said, screw it. I'm making this adventure. And and so I'm not at a lot lack for inspiration because it just kind of flows one on one little brick on top of the next, right? As I build the pyramid, I don't know to where, but somewhere at the top, there's something that maybe oh, the eye will look at me or something. But uh, the uh, but that's what I do. You know? So I won't lack for anything. Uh, I have to be worried. I'm not worried about my imagination and my but design ability. I'm worried about whether my my body ages out so fast that you're. I can't uh, type anymore. Understood. Uh, one question, from, one last question from the audience. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, place your Barbarous Coast um, information is available for purchase? Barbarous Coast. Barbarous Coast, Tim Shanks is posting. Ah, yes. Um, there's another one that should be finished. It was it was my knockoff of what would have been the Wild Coast. Okay. It's got... Uh, you know, the maps were finished for it. They all had to be changed, as Alan knows. And uh, the uh, yeah, there's even a place called Groton there on the map. Nice. Uh, Set up to Alan, and um, I had to change all the names and everything. And and there's no place I could publish. I have the old manuscript. Maybe I'll just put it up online sometime. I don't finish it. Or maybe Robert, somebody, I think you it. had some info about it a little bit in the archive as well, um, if I remember right. Um, I put the maps in there. Okay. Yeah. But I didn't put the manuscript. Manuscript. I would sit tight on that too, because I I think we may we may know someone who may be interested in publishing seriously. So. I mean, well, if you find me a publisher, let me know. I, I think Ann and I know one that may, yeah, we'll talk. Um, so, uh, wow, this has been unbelievable yep. discussion. Mm -hmm. I love it. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I, love, I mean, we've already passed two hours. I'm not a god. <laughs> we've, already gone, I'm not a god. <laughs> we've already gone past two entire hours on this. <laughs> this has been a blast. This, no, I I already foresee. Like I said, the uh, um, you know something like uh, uh, just the life and the life and adventures of Lord Robar in a discussion. That we just mm -hmm. talk about that for two oh, yeah. hours. Stories. We can, we can have story. another one of Thoristune. Thoristune stories. Or, 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 I mean, we can go into little. My, you see, I'm I'm doing my collective works right now. That includes all the adventure stories of Robar. Now, once I tell them live, there's no one going to buy my book. That's true. So, so what you do you is highlight. You, you, exactly. You come online, you talk 10 minutes of each thing, and then you have the long write-up published, yeah, ready to go. So, so yeah, you talk about it. That sounds like something Watsi would do with the OGL. <laughs> <laughs> We're just trying to make sure that your, uh, you know, your, your audience is aware they can purchase and support your creativity. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? Mm -hmm. While we were just chatting here, and I never, I bought the uh, Deluxe El Raja Key Archive. I already bought it and uh, Express shipped it. 
So there you go. Because I haven't got yeah. it yet. I've been holding off. I, I, oh, I, 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 I bought it. You buy already, it now, then, then. I already bought it just in the uh, last Alan, five minutes. Alan, would you have them in your booth at the. Um... Yeah, we'll have them at uh, Gary Con. Okay, then I'll. Yeah. Alan's got stuff on hold for me, me and, too, uh, for Gary Con, hopefully. Yeah. For Rob. Yep, from then Rob. I'll I, buy a copy yep. from you there. So, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did you say again? Alan's got stuff already on hold for me that I'm going to pick up and buy from him at Gary oh, Con. Yeah, yeah so. guys, me too now. Yeah. Yeah. Guy's sending the What are you all doing at Gary Con? Stock. What are we doing at Gary Con? Yeah, what are you doing? Oh, we'll oh, wow. talk about that in a second. How's that sound? We got, I got, I got like 20 things I'm doing at Gary Con. I'm doing <laughs> stuff with Paul, too. I'm doing stuff with Paul. I'm doing stuff with Ed Greenwood. I'm doing stuff. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's just, it's crazy how much we're doing at Gary Con this year. It's yeah, going to be a blast. How about you, Alan? What you doing? Uh, I will be uh, running some adventures. Uh, this year, I'm running one of Gary's unpublished maps, one of the ones that Eric had drawn. Nice. And uh, you, and then I'll be running run, the booth. How can you run a map? Because I created my own key for it, because I don't have uh -huh. the key. Creativity. What, what, yeah. It's the chessboard yeah, level. The chessboard level? Yep. Ah. Mm. So, sure uh, my uh, key has nothing to do with reality. Uh, <laughs> and and I, yeah, Eric and I will hold fun. off. <laughs> and I will hold off on shout outs because we have. Yeah, we can do it tomorrow. We'll do yeah, shout outs do tomorrow it. night. So yeah, exactly, we do tomorrow. Robert, this is what I got going on. Wednesday night, I'm at the museum with with Paul Stormberg. Okay, for that event, I'm going to be doing interviews there. Uh, Wednesday night after that, I have, I have my Gavin this this talk show. Thursday, I'm DMing. Uh, I delve into the Lord's tomb. Which is already sold out, and that is for uh, uh, that's in Grey Oak City. Then we have <laughs> Legends and Lore. After that, our regular talk show from Wednesday night that's live streamed. Then Thursday, I have uh, a, a, low, a venture in the Low Road and the Lort Mills. Then we have uh, um, a thing where our publication, my free series of Altamira box set, that's going to come out with Troller Games. We have a uh, that. We, uh, we have the game with Ed Greenwood and yeah, Bill Meinhardt and Anna. I got yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I have a two. Yeah, I have a two-hour separate seminar when I go over and the fantasy map mapping show and, too. Yeah, yeah, and the fantasy mapping show. So, so we yeah. we well, are. Bug Luke uh, to have him invite me as a guest. He uh, he thinks I'm isolated in France now. He can fly me over. How about yeah. well, next year's next year's the official fiftieth, and maybe two weekends. So exactly. Then, well, there you then, go. Uh, so his yeah. coordinator and his. Enforcer Zarathon is on right now watching. Did you hear that, yeah. Josh? Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. For, yep. Mm -hmm. better, uh, hopefully you heard that. Out, so, yeah. Let me make sure because he goes. He goes for facilitator these days. Yeah. 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 There you go. He heard. He heard it loud and clear. Okay. He heard good. it loud and clear yeah. right there. He mm -hmm. just said, "Ha ha, yes, uh, got it." Yeah. So, awesome. awesome. That would yep. be great because, uh, man. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it's been a while since Ed's been there, and I know uh, we're. I'm looking, I can't wait to hang out with Ed. Uh, you know, he just. Uh, and uh, here's the thing, Rob. Ed plays in my game in Greyhawk. The Career of Forgotten Realms plays in my Greyhawk game with Anna and Eric Mangi and Eric Boyd um, and a couple of uh, Tony Winslow Brill. So every couple of months we get together and we live stream it. So um, yeah, sounds like it is a blast. It's a blast. Come on, Alan, are you playing any games these days? I am. I run uh, my campaign uh, alternate Saturday nights, uh, and that, that's uh, currently the characters are en route from the city of Greyhawk to Hardby, and they may well encounter a certain anti-paladin with interests in Moor Castle on the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then I'm run I've been running a solo campaign uh, for my son Henry. Uh, who you'll remember. So he's a freshman now in high school. And uh, he also DMs a solo campaign for me. I was rushing the airport with him when Henry was being born. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, by the way, uh, we have a virtual crowd con every October. We've uh, This will be year four for it. Uh, uh, Rob and uh, uh, Alan ran Bottle City the one year, right? He's run, he's run a lot of stuff of yours at that con too. And that'll be coming up. Well, let's get through Gary read, Con. And we'll I read WG5 about. this last time. I need time. to be yeah. running some of my stuff again. I need uh, to get back in the DM seat. Well, we I, can make that happen. We can make that happen virtually easily yes. through mm -hmm. this channel. I can, that's no problem. Well, it's much more fun in person. It is. Yes, it is. You, it yeah, is. absolutely. I agree. But if you want to do it, well, from we can have you, you, you want, but I can't make you uh, feel fear over the internet. Oh yeah, you can. 
Ah, I oh, have yeah. faith in your ability to uh, make a sphere rock. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. But let's, uh, we'll work on that. Uh, Josh has already got his marching orders. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, so, uh, anything you want to say in closing? I mean, this has been a, such a wonderful discussion. Oh, yeah, I really wonderful. appreciate your time. This has mm -hmm. been, and we're going to have more of these. I guarantee it. Oh, well, yeah. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm stuck on an island. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a beautiful island, right? Oh, yeah. Of course, it gets oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Land wise, it's. It's remarkable. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's fantastic. Well, the island is made up of its people. I like to remind yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, uh, we're gonna hit the giveaways real quick here. Uh, do them. I got some troll again gift certificates. We'll have the same thing tomorrow night with Ed's on. Um, so let me do that real quick here in chat, and then we'll uh, raid into someone. Uh, Anna, Alan, uh, Rob. Any last any last thoughts, man? What any, a, what... any more questions from the chat room? There, there will probably one, uh, be a number of questions that will have follow-ups, Rob. We could forward them to you afterward yeah, uh, uh, yeah. as well if you're interested. I'll give um, you this one. Or from, save them for a part two. I'll give remember, you this one from Les. Fans, I'm not about the intermediaries. Yeah. I got a good one from Les Reno who always gives me these obscure things that I don't know about which are brilliant. And he said, ask Rob about the Temple of Latter-day Elder Ones. Oh. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you are about to find out. <laughs> See? Hold, see your, hold your hips. Uh, <laughs> the, the Temple of the Latter day Elder Ones. Well, obviously, it's influenced by somebody called H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith. To us. It was one of the original level which I had sculpted for Castle uh, Roger K which I decided to put on the Greyhawk near outdoor, right outside the city. And also a follow-up level called the Annex, which attaches, which was the level that was sent off to... Uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew Norton. Andrew Norton for yep. Quad Keep uh, to look at. And along with the other things I sent to her, is we got package together make her uh, uh give her a little bit more grounding what D, D was about but uh yeah it's uh it ties into uh what is going on to the city sewers it then ties into what's going on uh, leapfrogs into formal hall and uh at my and, it, and it's to, uh, Alan mentioned the uh, article I published in AFS, which I republished online. Uh, a little crafty and mythos and, and early D and D. It relates to that. I brought Lovecraft and Smith and and those elements into the campaign, and they had the secret temple, and they were taking over the town through the sewers, and had a connection with another. A church within the town. I had all sorts of weird things going on in City Greyhawk, and all of it was going on beneath and out of sight. So was it the thieves in the assassin skill who were using it only to traffic? They were also being ambushed by uh, the things that the they were putting in there. Uh, Alan went on an adventure along with uh, Arrow Otis oh. and uh, into the sewer. Uh, into the Greyhawk sewers, uh, where you ran into one of these characters and uh, came up against one of the creatures. Yep. Well, there was a connection to that out to the Temple of the Latter Day Elder, which they trafficked. Through. That's so. So cool. it's really a, a granular thing, which to, incorporates the sewers, things that are going on in the city, and things outside the city, and then off-world that is being brought in. So I wasn't fooling around. I went full bolt on this with the campaign. So. Excellent. I know Les always comes up with those great questions, man. When you know, What a great contributor uh, asking things. Well, um, ask, you don't find out. I did. I, I, I just, I don't know why I did not know that. Uh, how do you pronounce Thariz Dun originally? Thariz Dun is Thariz Dun. Okay. My uh, my God, which is based on, is stars do one. 
Thars to one. Okay. Well, it's a D U apostrophe U N. Okay. Thars to one. You Got can, it. It's in, in in this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get this, and you can get the spelling. I have and you Get the story. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I have that. Yeah, it was twenty four dollars from Kinet. Chaotic Henchman. You can mm -hmm. know the pronunciation of Thars to one. Yeah. Uh, See if I can link it in Drive Through RPG here. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, that's uh. That's Thars available in PDF, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it is not not yeah. in uh, not in a, a hard I copy. I think so. I, should, I, want the, I got the three I third. I said I got the third edition hard copy, the D twenty hard copy. I got the Troller Games version from third yeah, edition. I, yeah, yeah. I got I that, it's... but I don't have. I, and I don't have it in PDF. But I don't have the one e one in hard copy. And then I also have Karen the Skeleton King. I'm uh, looking for Tower of Blood, so which is the sequel, right? So, uh, have you yeah. Ever, uh, have you ever uh, played that? Have you ever DM'd it? I'm going to DM that live stream. Oh, well, we yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's Karen, this year. Karen, uh, uh, in fact, speaking of Guy Fullerton, who's chaotic henchman, he was Guy who loved, loved running his 